as well as Barbara Chow and Chris Shear, who were the Hewlett Packard reps, to say that they were very highly impressed with your outstanding work and dedication to the kids in your schools and districts, as well as to the PACE effort. The teacher dedication and ownership of the system was astounding to them, something that they often see in the charter schools only. They'd come hoping to see a new way of assessment and accountability for the future of public education in America, and they each stated their hope and expectations were fulfilled. Thanks again for your tremendous planning and support of the visit. You made us all proud. And I share that as a testament to the entire SAU 39 and the work done, uh, and specifically the work that the PACE initiative has created in the last couple of years. We are now being recognized at state and, uh, and national level uh, for some of the work that we're doing. And, uh, and it's part thank you on the school's behalf for being supported by the board and the community on that. Uh, so I did want to take some time to highlight the PACE visit. The other areas, the uh, department growth plans, I just mentioned I would share a template. I hope you were able to see that template. And um, uh, phase one of the drafts are completed, and phase two will begin, and we'll share the phase two templates as they roll out. Can I answer that? Was that sure. a, I looked at that. Is that a one-year plan, like the goals and what they need, you know, from administration to meet those? Is that a one-year plan, or is it sometimes two or three-year goals? It'll probably be, you know, a two-year, year and a half. You'll notice on the template there's a milestone section where they'll, yeah. um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, after probably you know, before the beginning of the year, indicate when certain things will be finished. It's somewhat an agile uh, project plan. So we'll set dates and they might move sooner or later depending on the work. But yeah. you can probably see that more in the context of a two year okay. two year plan where some of the things being finished by the end of this year in the summer. Thanks. Um, is this Steve, professional growth? Is this professional growth for or what? No. no, what we did, David, is we asked all the uh, departments to come up with a department growth plan, and we modeled it on the template of our new teacher leader effectiveness individual growth plan. So every department has put together uh, a growth plan for the next, you know, year to two years. So, um, so it is professional growth. Like department, yeah, it, it's yeah, like okay. departmental strategic planning, yeah. Okay. And within that, there might be some targeted professional growth for individuals, but it's you know every department we wanted to establish. Um, uh, a plan for where they're heading and how we're going to evolve. There's a link um, in, in Rob's principal's report, <coughs> so it, that would give you more information. Okay. And under teacher leader effectiveness, just a quick update about stages. I hope that link worked, and uh, stages has already gotten some positive reviews by both staff and the leadership team who are using it. And what it just moves, it moves uh, what has been pen and paper for years to you know, a web-based and an electronic uh, system to automate our staff observations. And it does a great job of collecting the information, updates, and uh, it's really, really already paid some dividends in um, the, the efficiency. So I wanted to share with you that link so you could explore that a little bit. I also wanted to highlight that um, another phase of teacher leader effectiveness is uh, student surveys being part of the observation. And so we're excited about that. Really preliminary stages, and um, we'll have more to share later. And uh, Christine has been really, really helpful in um, getting that off the ground. And we have a new tool for that as well. But we're in the very early stages of that. So I wanted to highlight its beginning, but we'll be able to give you some more information as we start. Um, engaging in that process of students being part of uh, uh, or student surveys being used as part of the observation. And again, happy to take questions, uh, but <clears throat> I did want to mention Steve visited my office today to make sure the principal's report would be finished in a timely manner. So. <laughs> I don't know if sitting next to me now. Like, like a little shakedown, he asked to sit there. <laughs> he said, it's great reading, but not fantastic listening. He's in the lecture, lecture right, area. Right. Not lecture so, <laughs> very excited about, uh, oh, and I included the word language. I know we had spoken about that. Just as an example of one of the departments doing some fantastic work. And so the word language department continues its work in developing competencies and exploring instructional methods to meet student need as well as inform our work in redesigning the program of studies. 
So the World Language Department has worked on uh, what their competency is going to be, more of a proficiency-based model, and we really think that um, what they'll be able to come up with is uh, an answer to uh, some of the issues we're dealing with, with uh, what we can offer, you know, yeah. Spanish 1 through 5, can we offer that in the existing model? Possibly not, but in a competency proficiency base, you're folding things in and, and the curriculum can be redesigned. So they might be one of the first departments that models that kind of efficiency where uh, in a competency based model you can provide a really robust program of studies at no additional staff or um, you know additional uh, other resources needed so <coughs> I just wanted to tease out the very beginning of that work and once they finalize phase two of the growth plan I'd be happy to share mm -hmm. um, that electronically as, as well but I thought it was important to bring that up because we know we're um, in all, all sorts of areas looking to really offer a student experience that doesn't prevent anybody's needs from being met, but we are coming up against in current model um, how we can do that. So we're looking at instruction and we're looking at the policy based uh, approach as an answer to that. So the other thing I want to mention is just our Healthy connections. Uh, again, we're using data to inform us on where students need education in areas. And Peter, John Young, um, Karen, uh, Officer Smith have been instrumental in developing healthy connections. And the juniors and seniors will be participating <coughs> in one, I believe, uh, Thursday when we get back around uh, drug abuse, uh, specifically epidemic. Uh, in um, uh, you know probably the last couple of years and, and unfortunately locally as well in the you know, the opiates and and heroin and uh, prescription pills etc so we'll have a, a healthy connection uh, on November 12th the leave totals uh, you requested that I uh, bring those to your attention uh, and I attached but I'm not sure if that link worked so I'll that reattach the, that, yeah, that yeah. Yeah. that I'll work. reattach that and uh, basically what you would have seen is just a summary that uh, a percent of our um, out of class time is really in PD uh, professional development the good news we think is when you look at that the percent of time where a substitution a, a substitute is needed is minimal because we're asking folks especially with the in house professional development let's arrange it when a majority of people don't have classes so I'll reattach that but analysis of it is um, we're trying to minimize out of class time the majority of the out of class time was in some PD which makes sense because of all the work we're doing but we're designing PD more in-house and optimizing during free period so if you look at how many instances of out of class time we have but align it with how many times a sub was needed, you're going to see that um, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, minimal. So as I said, we talked about including that. So I'll try to re I'll reattach that and happy to talk about it uh, <coughs> again. Notes of interest. I hope you had a chance to look at that uh, link. We think it's fascinating. This is uh, when we talk about education is changing. Uh, this is one of those examples. At least 80 colleges and universities announced plans for a new application process and a new approach to preparing high school students uh, and that would be portfolio based and it would be interesting in that new portfolio base how it pushes down into schools and um, asks them in a healthy way for 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade students to all consider what their post-grad plan is going to be um, and when you look at it quite frankly it's very analogous to what we do with our Division One exhibition and our work with our juniors and a portfolio we do that with our ninth and tenth graders we have a portfolio their work and explain how they've grown as learners so it's going to be right up our alley and we're exciting to watch that grow but uh, I also feel there's so much interesting things globally in education I try to highlight some of those in the, in the principal's report and Jesse in the news page, uh, all the great things that are happening. We have, I included an alumni uh, email. Um, it's senior project season 
Uh, we recently received an email, and um, we're also working on uh, organizing this in a more formal fashion because I think one of the measurements that we'll use is, you know, our alumni news um, more than just anecdotally, but right now we have a real, uh, you know, robust collection of anecdotal um, information. Hi, Maggie. I don't know if you remember me, but I graduated from SHS back in 2009. I, I can hardly believe it's been so long. Um, I wanted to write to you because I'm about to switch jobs, and I actually owe it all to my senior project at SHS, so I figured you might be interested in this story. I did a project about political polling, and in the course of that project, I got in touch with an outside expert at a survey research firm. Uh, my expert was based at the Washington, D.C. office, and he was extremely helpful in guiding me through the designing my own survey. Because of this contact, I interned for two summers while I was in college, and I ended up really enjoying the work that they did. I've been working for another company for the last two years, but tomorrow I'm actually starting a new job at the company where uh, I did my senior project, where my outside expert worked. It's so crazy how life works out, and she goes on to mention, I'd love to hear how things are at Sohegan, although I'm sure it has changed so much since my time there. I'm feeling like 2009 was so long, so long ago, but I hope that everything there is going well and you're enjoying your summer. Senior Project still ranks among the most meaningful projects I have ever completed in my education, so I thought that was just very telling uh, as Senior Project season is up and running, and um, I really feel that strong evidence of uh, how we're moving to a competency-based, performance-based um, experience and that's what higher ed and uh, industry is looking for. Um, students who can perform and students who have a level of knowledge and ability to apply it. So, happy to respond to any questions, but that's... Any questions for, for Rob? I wonder if Steve has any questions. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Steve re reads it thoroughly. I, I, actually, I, I mean, there's always so much information. It's kind of hard because Rob is like talking so fast, trying to get it all in. But there's, I, I didn't even know about that that survey, that student survey, the tripod, um, and apparently there's a committee that put it together of teachers and administrators, and I didn't even know it was going on. So I, I like, you know, that we get to hear the. <clears throat> Administrative just reports. An, yeah, just an extension of the teacher leadership committee. It's just the next step was exploring this. So it's yeah. still that same committee, a subgroup that explored this, came up with uh, tripod. Teachers volunteered, and then we'll they'll have some training. So after the teacher training and initial implementation, we can have yeah. another update. Yeah, and uh, I love to hear about the senior project or reading about it. Also, um, I know we have some community members that are going to be coming and being on our senior project panel, which I think is great. And one of the things that we haven't even had a chance to talk about, we'll talk about in December, is fall forum. And one of the ideas that came out of that is is having community members on roundtables, having a, more roundtables starting in eighth grade, and having community members on them um, also. So it, it's great to showcase the exhibitions that we have. Any other comments or questions for Ron? Okay. So moving on. Um, first, I'd like to we're our next. Um, I, agenda item is community council report and I want to introduce Elizabeth Purvis. She is our new community council liaison. Elizabeth is a junior here and she was elected to be our liaison um, at our last meeting on Monday. So welcome Liz. Hi. Um, thank you Mary Lou. Um, yeah. And Liz gave us a, yes. um, a, a printed copy of what she's going to discuss. So on council, we recently just started talking, or we just passed this proposal that I've um, given to everybody. It was presented by Wally and Carrie Smallwood, and they are two of our learning specialists, in case you don't happen to know who they are. And the proposal um, basically is asking to get rid of credit for upperclassmen for taking... Um, for taking um, academic. academic support, thank you. And uh, Vodal, blah. council voted in support of the proposal. And a lot of the major, major points that were brought up in council were the fact that upperclassmen, and when I say upperclassmen, I mean juniors and seniors, have the ability to take a free period where underclassmen do not. And the fact that academic support often gets abused and used as a homework period. So 
the major, those were the major reasons why that it was passed. Um, some other points that were brought up were that it does benefit students, that um, they do learn while in that setting, and it helps to have a teacher in the room. However, there are upperclassmen that during their free periods they can go work with their teachers one-on-one, -on -one, or they can come in the learning commons, and if there's an adult in the room, they can get help from them. So we just passed that last Monday. And then um, last Friday, I believe it was, there was the fall forum, which Mary Lou just mentioned. And um, I personally didn't go, but it was in <coughs> Portland, Maine, and it was um, on the national level, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. And I heard that it was a very positive experience. A lot of council members went, uh, including students, and I've heard that it was um, very positive, and we've gotten some ideas of how we can improve as a school as well. And we're going to invite the students and faculty members uh, to the <coughs> meeting next month to talk about fall forum. So we'll discuss it more then and get, and get the students' feedback. But I agree, Liz, it was a positive experience, especially for the students, it seemed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that. Um, we're also going to put, um, if anyone has any questions for Liz, but we're going to put for an agenda item for December. Um, discussion about the proposal that was passed because it was because it has to do with curriculum it was a recommendation to the school board because it doesn't actually fall under community council's purview so this is a recommendation that the school board um, can discuss and vote on so we'll have that as an action item for December's agenda but in the meantime if you'd like to ask Liz she'll be here next month too but if you want to ask her any questions about that and again like Liz said it was um, taking credit away right now juniors and seniors can take academic support and get credit for it and the thought process is is they're working and learning in that class and so therefore they get credit um, and um, I think one of the things that Carrie and Wally felt was that you know just like when you move on to college or move from middle school to high school you accept responsibilities of being more in, a more independent learner and this would help that one of the key things, though, that um, their proposal is the, um, based on is the fact that the learning commons will be staffed um, all periods so that the students that need the support, in particular students with IEPs or 504s, will have somewhere to go and get the support that they need. Um, so I guess that was one of the, um, I guess, drawbacks that came up is we would have to be ensured that this, the learning commons was actually staffed. Um, they felt if the learning specialists weren't spending time in academic support classrooms, they would be able to be in the learning commons. But that is not, you know, that would be up to the administration as well. So next month we can get feedback from them as well. Jeannie? Um, could I just ask, um, I didn't read this carefully, so um, if it's on here, I apologize. Um, do all grades get credit for academic support? Yes. Um, currently, all grades get it. So you can take it all four years and end up getting four credits in academic support. And that was another reason why it was brought up, because uh, Wally and Carrie believe that students should push themselves as upperclassmen and take um, more new learning classes, as they put it, where you're learning new material. So you take another science class, or you could take a free period as an option. So that was the major driving force behind the proposal. Can I ask one more question? Yep. Um, how is how is that um, explained? I guess is the word um, on a transcript. I mean, what? How does how does a college see academic support? I mean, what are they? That'd be for Rob. Yeah, Rob. Yeah, we can check with, I, I don't know if Karen's here for the actual identification. Academic support, Karen, it's identification on the transcript is? So it, we use that title, right? Okay. And again, we can discuss it more next month, too, because the administration isn't prepared, you know, to discuss it. And we didn't have it as an action item. <coughs> okay. I'm um, sorry. For the, I just oh, no, 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 no. Don't be sorry, because I, I wanted you to ask questions of Liz. She will be here um, next next month also. I didn't know if there's any questions about the discussion surrounding this proposal that Liz might be able to answer now. But, yeah, but we will have it as an action item in December. Okay. 
All right. Any other questions for Liz or no? All right. Thank you. And again, welcome. We'll see you next month. Okay. So <coughs> we'll move on to committee reports. Um, so any committees wishing to report out? The policy committee uh, met yesterday. Yesterday? Dave run together. <laughs> it was yesterday. Yesterday. Uh, we're in the process of streamlining our, the process of getting the policies to the boards. Uh, we worked on one policy and finalized that, and it's the uh, BCA. It's the ethics policy for all of all the boards and that will be coming to each individual board now uh, and then we talked about how to better streamline our, our process and we think that we have that pretty much figured out the process of reviewing all the right. um, policies it's a, a daunting task because mm -hmm. it's so many policies and once you get started doing one set of policies and you go through and all of a sudden you have to go back to the beginning and start over again. Yeah. So. Can yeah. I was going to say this. I, we want to make sure that Karen Chinunas can hear us. So she could hear me. So we just, it's, I know it's, because I was back there one time, it's a long room. <coughs> to make sure people can hear us in the back as well as in the home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any other committees? The stadium project committee? Do you have an update? Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I asked uh, Travis Warren for where, uh, an update of where we are um, financially, and out of the estimated $918,000 um, for the project, we're at a total of 765000 so we're, that's about the 83% level, so we're still a bit short. We're, we're still pursuing a few large donors, um, but we've got a lot of bricks to sell, too, so... Uh, <laughs> Better, better ways to go than that, I think. Um, and we're, we're continuing to move up, and we're getting close to about 100 or so sold, but we need at least 200. Is that? I was going to ask what the goal was as far as the number of bricks. Yeah, I think the, the initial goal was like 500. Correct. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, well, we've got 22 years worth of about 250 graduates per year. Exactly. <laughs> so well, we, we have heard that subject about getting um, alumni, access to alumni uh, information, yeah. and I don't know where that's gone. I don't Probably think we nowhere. I know there's been talk um, of, and, and I'm not sure where we stand on that, there was actually an alumni who was willing to help set up like an alumni database, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's still in the beginning stages. But right now, I'm not sure that we have um, the ability to, other than personal contact of yeah. you know, people that we know, which we should all reach out to. Um, and I did want to reiterate, too, that you just reminded me. We said this last time, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. To buy a brick, you can go to amherstfoundation.org mm -hmm. and backslash stadium. Um, and it's also on the SAU 39 website under Sahegan High School. And there's um, each brick can be engraved with three lines, 14 characters per line. So, so yeah, if you haven't already, or if you're, you know, they could be coaches' gifts, they could be graduation gifts, you know, um, whatever your favorite teacher, favorite coach, so mm -hmm. a team brick. But they've, the committee, in particular, the fundraising part of the committee has done a great job, you know, really working hard. So thank you guys. Any other, anything else to add? Dave, do you have anything to add? No. All right. Mary Lou, is this the time when you might want to summarize our discussion the other night? Um, uh, yeah, actually, thank you for reminding me of that. We um, had a board discussion. It was a public meeting, but we talked about um, concerns that have come out specifically by a Washington um, coach, Washington State coach, um, soccer coach, and um, we, uh, it had to do with the crumb rubber filling in, in the, the um, turf field. So we just wanted people to know that we are on top of that. We are watching that. We are looking for any new information. Right now, there is no scientific data um, that, you know, about any detrimental effects um, from the turf field. But we are, you know, on, we are aware and watching to see if there are any studies done or any concerns brought up. So, um, so yeah, and have been in touch with a couple different outside experts as well. 
Anything else, Jeannie, you want to add? Because I know you've talked to some outside experts, but... No, that's, no. Okay. that's, that's about it. Thank you. All right. No other committee reports? Steve, do you know if um, PPC, because you mentioned this last time, has done, they were going to do a, a survey on insurance buyouts, because um, this is the time of year, so I didn't know if that was... There was a survey done. Um, there was a preliminary discussion at the last PPC meeting about the survey results suggest it may not be economic, but Betty was going to look into the data, and I don't know if she's had a chance uh, to do that. Well, yes, uh, actually, I didn't do it because the PPC did not want to meet on it again. So uh, that's kind okay. of, I think we'll have to pursue it next year. Next year during negotiations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, public comment. I know there's at least one member of the public. Um, I don't know. Do you want to switch seats with her? Do you want to let her yeah. yes. pull a chair up or let her take no, your microphone? Can, uh, she can have my seat. All right, welcome, Maggie. I mean, you can introduce yourself, but welcome. Hi, I'm Maggie McCabe, and um, uh, I've, I'm a uh, resident of Amherst. And I had the opportunity, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for letting me speak um, to this group. I had the opportunity to speak to the ASD group, and I'm kind of doing the same thing that I did with them. Okay, so in front of you, I'm sorry that you didn't get this ahead. I thought it was attached to the agenda request, but um, anyway, I guess you didn't see it. But what it is is a dump of a lot of historical information from the State of New Hampshire website. And <clears throat> it's basically all the history I could find from the DOD website. And it starts in the left hand from year 2001 going up to uh, 2021. And um, if there's not information filled in, that means that there wasn't that information available on the, uh, the state website. So I filled in what I could for that time period. Okay. In some cases, there was enrollment numbers. Um, the staffing numbers only went back you know, to 2005-06. So I completed whatever I can. So I'm going from left to right. I'm just going to walk you through the columns. And if you followed any of my articles that were in the paper, my lengthy tomes that were in the paper. Um, this is basically what this is all about. It's explaining cost per pupil, all in per pupil costs, and how the numbers all come together. So on the left-hand side are the staffing numbers broken down into those categories, teachers through other, other support total staff. And then it shows the percentage um, changes uh, decrease between those years. Then the next column is student enrollment and the enrollment percentage changes, the cost per pupil, the percentage changes of cost per pupil, the ADM, which is the calculation of um, attendance that's used for the calculation of cost per pupil. And then by taking the ADM times the cost per pupil, I came up with this estimated co cost per pupil actuals. That's not the total budget. It's just the portion that's related to cost per pupil. And then on top of that, there's the next column, other costs, which are transportation, the things that are taken out of cost per people that are then added back in. And then the, the, the next column is the total actual budget. And I confirmed those with Betty. So those are the annual appropriation budgets. So if you see, um, oh, then I put in the state mean cost per people, and I, I'll address that on the next attachment. Um, and the percentage above or below that, that ours is to the state, the all-in per pupil cost. So if you look at the column that says per pupil cost, so let's just take the year 2013-2014. Our per pupil cost was 19,012. Our all-in per pupil cost was 21,538 with Warren articles and the things that were taken out of cost per pupil. <clears throat> then the last two columns are the student to teacher ratio, which um, you've mentioned in other meetings, um, the last number we have is 10.66. And then the final column is the student to the total staff ratio. That means um, for each student there are 5.85 adults, which to me sounds like a lot. That's just a commentary. Isn't the other way around? 5.5 students per adult. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yes, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Sorry, I had it backwards. Yes, that's, yes, there's about six students per adult. Yes, okay. So then if you look in the lower left-hand column, the summary, 
The enrollment decreased was 18.36%. The cost per pupil increase was 50.92%. And the CPI index for that same time period was 14.16%. And the staff decrease was 12.28%. And if you go to the middle section, um, the percentage above the state mean was 34.75. Our target is 10% above CE. S peer groups, and I'm not sure how that's defined, so I use the state. And we can just you can discuss that with me. And then the production, the the percentage reduction needed to equalize with the peers. And the whole point of this is I wanted everyone to see the numbers in one place, because the bottom line is we need to manage <coughs> our enrollment decreases because they're not going to go away. Our, our demographics are that we're, our state demographics are that we are a declining student population. And we've got to vie for those um, students, which is why I want to look at the next. So basically, this is just a lot of information that I want you to have. And I've seen bits of it in pieces all over the place, but it's good to see it all together. And hopefully, it will make sense of the stuff I've been writing in the paper because you'll see the columns and how they tie in. So the second attachment is why I use the state mean, okay? Because one of the things I mentioned in the articles is that there's an inverse relationship between if enrollment declines, cost per pupil goes up. No matter what you do, if you keep the budget flat, it's an inverse relationship. So it's important to look at, and this is a chart that Betty did from um, the deliberative session, so I brought it back to you. The little red things are mine, okay? But the reason I use the state is because if you look at the state and you look at Sauhegan, the state decreased by 12% this, and Sauhegan decreased by 14. Cost per pupil went up 30 and 31. It's a good comparison because we had the same, almost the same rate of decline. Mm -hmm. If you look at Bo, which is in the left-hand column, Bo went down 27% and their cost per pupil went up 45. So part of it is that they went down, enrollment went down, inverse relationship, cost per pupil goes up. But the other thing you could say is they did not react as quickly to declining enrollment as they should have. On the other end of the <coughs> spectrum, at the other column, is Bedford. It's the only one in the list where um, Enrollment increased and cost per pupil decreased. Again, inverse relationship. We want to aspire to be that bar graph. We want to have people come into our community and increase the number of pupils who decide that Amherst is the town and that is related to quality. Okay, so if we can have more students come in, automatically your cost per pupil goes, goes down. Okay, so that ties in with the whole strategic plan and quality. Yes. Can I ask, and Betty, you might, was this, are these high schools or are these total districts? Uh, I think, uh, I think I did high schools for that. I don't level. know. It was Betty's well, chart from the deliberative. Okay. okay. I'm not sure, really. Then just, then Bedford would not be a good example because Bedford, as a new high school, started with two grades only and then add another grade and then add well, another grade. Well, and that could be part of their growth. But what I'm right. saying That's is, grew, that right? is part of why they grew. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I could have said that, that they're, I could have just focused on that their cost per pupil is lower. What I'm trying to show to you is it's, it's a nuance. It's not because there is this inverse correlation. It's, mm -hmm. it's nuanced. It's like um, you can do it a number of different ways. You can increase your student population by attracting more young families into our community, which is also good for the real estate values and people who want to sell their houses. But, I mean, there's different ways to do it. But I think you have to look at it in the combination of quality and costs. The, the other page was focused more on the costs mm -hmm. and that we declined staff only 12% when our enrollment declined 18%. Okay, and where we stood in comparison. And I know there's talks about peer group, and the problem is you can't just pick a peer group um, because you have to look at these, these issues. Mm -hmm. Did their enrollment decline as much as our enrollment decline? If not, how do you equate for that enrollment decline? So it's, you know, you're, the, the reason I used the state was because the state was pretty close to ours. Right. We went down 12, they went down, we went down 14, they went down 12. So it was pretty close, so it gives us. Now, what 
percentage should we be in comparison to the state number? I don't know. Is it the 10 percent that's the CES, or is it 15 percent? That is a topic you guys can debate. Okay? That's my first topic. My second topic was the paving. Um, I know in the budget, and I, maybe we'll hear some more about it, um, there was 600000 proposed for the pa paving project. For the, and I'm not sure where it stands in the budget, and we'll find out. But if you read my last article, I'm, I'm a proponent of Warren articles. And I'm a proponent of bonding with Warren articles for infrastructure. And the reason is, I think the equity issue is the overriding factor. If you are going to have an asset that lasts 10 or 15 or 20 years, then all of the taxpayers should share in that cost over the life of that asset. So the way it was originally proposed in the assumptions was a three-year, 200000 for the paving. That means the taxpayers over the next three years will pay for that. That's not an equitable distribution of the cost to all the taxpayers. So I want to raise that. I don't know if anything's going to come out about that. And I prefer bonding, even though it costs more money. And one of the questions I asked, and I went back and did research on it, why was the roof only done over seven years? Okay, and I was told there was a second proposal. I went and found it. It was 10 years. Still, I would have said, why wasn't it? 7, 10, 20 originally. Well, I saw in the paper the article referred to two proposals, a 7-year and a 10-year. I would have said it should have been 15 or 20, the life of the asset, because that's how then you equally pay for it. Each taxpayer equally pays for it. So I think for capital projects that are infrastructure-related, bonding with a Warren article with bonding is the best way to go. And I also think you have to make a case to the taxpayers on a separate Warren article. And with the paving project, since it was a part of the original 2.950 project, 2,950,000 that was taken out, you have to ask why was it. And I, I'll tell you the part of it is that our roads are terrible in town. I know that's not your problem. but we got to go look at the parking lot. And if I have to decide, I'm going to go look at my road and look at the parking lot and decide who should get the money. Because the roads in the town are terrible, too. So that's, that's another issue why, if it's a safety issue, then make a case to the voters by a Warren article. And if you decide not to do it as bonding, I'm OK with that if you've made the case to the, and the town all approves it that way. But I do think it needs to be a separate case, not embedded in the operating budget. Okay, that, that's the second thing. The third thing is um, I wanted to talk about unfunded pension, unfunded liabilities. I went to the audit statement of last year, and there are unfunded liabilities in the audit statement. I don't know where we are with the audit this year, um, but last year there were uh, compensated balances, which is equivalent to sick leave payout, of 874,171 in the audit, and other post-employment benefits of 640,264. This concerns me for the same reason I just articulated about having the right taxpayers pay for these things. If we have an unfunded liability, future taxpayers are going to be paying for that unfunded liability. So, follow my article from last month. We should be doing capital capital reserves for these unfunded liability. It also helps if we ever want to go build something, because it helps your bonding, bond rating if you have funded the unfunded pension liability. And the state of New Hampshire is ranked sixth in unfunded pension liabilities. Our state pension system's in trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, six meaning there's only four, five that are worse than us. Mm -hmm. And we only fund 57.4% of our pensions. And the state Supreme Court in January came out saying, there is no guarantee you will get your pension. So it's concerning to me because we, as the employer of these people, have, have a liability issue. And we need to recognize it. And I think we should start accruing for it by setting up reserves. And um, there is a House bill. I wanted to bring this to the board's attention so maybe you guys could write to our state representatives. There is a House bill um, 369, which was just recently proposed. And what they are considering is trying to change the state pension plan from a defined benefit to a defined contribution. 
that way you pay as you go you contribute that's all our liability would be would be the contribution and it would go to the employees and not to the state and you wouldn't have the issue of the state mismanaging it not you know not making the investments they want not charging whatever they did I don't know what they did over the years but obviously 57.4 percent funding is not a stellar example of fiduciary responsibility so I, I bring all these things to you because I think some of them you might want to think about to incorporate in the budget or Warren articles or and I know I'm a little late because you already have budget one coming out tonight but it's something I know we have time to read revise and I'd like you to consider the proposals I'm suggesting yes Can I answer a question yeah um, <coughs> in number two mm -hmm. you talked about bonding versus a Warren article but you didn't mention one of the things that concerns me about bonding and that is is that when you bond you build it into the budget so it becomes part of the default for the, the subsequent years Whereas you have a Warren article and it goes through and it passes or whatever, it's that year. It's only that year. Right. Where do you stand on that? What do you think about that, Maggie? Well, that's what you did with the track. You put one Warren article in. It requires only 50% to approve and you've expent it. But you had on the track a reserve. So you applied part of it against the reserve and part of it. So it, it softened the blow. The point is, if you try to put, and I gave that example in the newspaper. I hope you've had a chance to read the article. If you put the whole 600000 in, you're up to almost the cost of the annual amortization cost per pupil for Bedford High School, for the whole high school. Like, it's $89 difference between a $600 over, you know, one year versus 600000 over one year versus um, a whole building over 24 years. That's the, that's the beauty of amortization, that you can spread the cost over the number of years. Does it cost more? Yes, because you're paying interest and you're paying, um, um, you know, you're, you're paying probably a bonding fee to get the bonding, whoever we use, municipal bonding company to help us with that, we're paying fees. But I think the over overriding factor is the equitable distribution of the cost to current and future taxpayers. And I will always come down on that. That, as an accountant, I think, you know, that's the whole point of amortization. That's why we amortize to well, be to spread the cost equally over the the life of the assets. Um, yes, if you remove the bonding costs in subsequent years after the bonding is done, after the bond payments are done, but that's not always the case that happens. You can always, unless there's a so, clause not allowing you to repay it. I mean, you could try to get clauses that say. Can you pay it, pay, pay it earlier? I don't know what the, the penalties would be on that, though. But, you know, I, I think if I would rather have you do the, I, I'd rather have you make the laundry list and come to the voters with a two or three million dollar bond for things that are going to last a long time and get them done at one time. But my concern is, is that when we paid off the bond for the school here in 2012, I think it was, I'm not sure. Your budget you didn't go down. The budget, it, it do you know basically why? that money was absorbed. No, do you, no, it wasn't. You know where it went? No. It where? went on the roof and the HVAC. And well, the, the reason is you only did it over seven years. If you had done that over 20 years or whatever the life of that asset would have been, then some of that money would have come out of the budget. Be because you, 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 by having a shorter amortization period, the amount per year was higher. And therefore, you almost, you well, like traded break, off. There was a year break in between the two, as I recall. I don't, maybe I'm not, I don't recall it correctly. Well, that's, that's okay. I mean, but I mean, it's but, close. It was close but, but to the the what it was. But the idea that, um, that if you bond something, the bond payments will stay, you know, are in for those three years or five years or whatever it is. And then that money is built into the default budget for, for subsequent years. Well, that's and the that's the problem. No, that, that shouldn't be the case because well, it shouldn't in, be, even but it in is. this, I just quickly looked through this budget and it shows the, those type of one-off things. Those are the kind of things that the board should be looking at. What are one-off things that are not going to be repeated from year to year? That's your fiduciary responsibility because there's probably more than just that that you need to look at. 
you know, maybe there was something that this year we did this special project and it's not going to be in there for next year. Those are the things you need to always look for. We, and we do, and, and Betty is good about pointing those out to us also. And we look at them because that would be our, our default budget or the one-off things that wouldn't occur in the following year's budget. So, but um, anyways, um, I, you know, thank you for coming and um, we appreciate it. And I think we could probably have, you know, discuss different philosophies, you know, for a long time, and we can maybe have a conversation outside of here, too, but... Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah. basically, I mean, you may not agree with how I approach things, but I do it from an accounting's, pr accountant's yeah. perspective. You obviously have a lot of knowledge in that, and so it's great to hear all the perspectives. So we appreciate you coming and for bringing the information, too, because it's kind of hard to like a deliberative, to talk when you don't have the information, right. the different scenarios in front of you. So oh, and the one thing I wanted to tell you about this HHB369, um, I mean, I think it it would be wise if the board is supportive of that idea to contact the state representatives on I was it. just going to, I was going to say that, I'm glad you did, is be that not just the board, but anyone can. Well, anyone can, but I mean, I think as a school district, if you say this is important to us, I think the teachers should be concerned about this. I think because so in January, the Supreme Court said, okay, you have a pension, but we're not going to guarantee it. It's yeah. not going to be guaranteed. And they can change the payouts, they can change the formulas, they can change the whole thing on you. So. As, a, as an employee, I'd rather much have, have the um, defined contribution plan that I know it's going to be mine, and I can manage it. I agree. The board, the staff, and and but also taxpayers and because taxpayers. they've been affected. By yeah, that because then sure. then whatever we contribute that year is all we're on the hook yep. for. Yep. And this is why I brought up the issue of the unfunded liability. I in the this year's audit, there's a new. Um, there's a new ruling on pensions under the um, General Accounting Standards Board, GASB. And now that liability, it's currently in the footnotes, or it's referenced in the footnotes. It's going to be on the, the balance sheet. It's going to be there as a liability, like these other two. And I'm concerned that these other two we need to address, because here's one of the things, like even the sick leave, we know you get 90 accumulated days, and at the end, you're going to have to pay those out. Yeah. Most teachers are going to have those 90 days at the end. I, I guarantee you, the number of years they're teaching, they're going to accumulate those 90 days. That is a liability that's going to happen. We're going to pay it. So by not accruing for it now and not saving for it now in a capital reserve, what happens if suddenly our enrollment decreases even further? And then we have no, let's say the normal is, we're doing it pay as you go. And the normal is four or five leave. Well, what happened if 10 leave and we don't have the extra money in the budget for that? Mm -hmm. You're going to wish you had a reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. you brought up a, oh, sorry. Could I, you, can I just ask a question? I thought we had an expendable trust fund of the, some kind the, that has that um, money set aside. We, we do have an expendable trust for um, federal liability. Um, there's not a lot of money in it. Okay, so we should probably yeah, boost that. Yeah, because when you look at the audit, they say it's zero funded for those lines. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just taking what the audit says, I, and it says I, zero. I, I just wanted to make a, a point of information, too, that um, bonding carries with it a much higher uh, bar for uh, passage. 60%. Yeah, so, yes. and it, it, you know, I've seen over time it takes us three tries, three year, you know, years in a row before we get bonds passed. So right, but, it is but, quite a bar to pass. No, and I understand that, and I understand that. But I think if you make a good argument, I don't think, I think the taxpayers will support we it. Do. I think, it is, no, I you're think absolutely the, right, the but track it sometimes was an issue. takes three tries. I mean, the get. track was an issue. You had a choice. You could have put the track in the budget. You decided to do it as a Warren article. Yes, it wasn't a bonded Warren article. And here's the thing. If it's something that's recurring, like if it were computers that you know every year you're going to have to spend a certain amount and roll them every year and buy so many, that's not the type of projects I'm talking about. I'm talking about projects that have useful lives over 10 years, you know, and have some kind of threshold, 250,000. Big projects. I'm not talking about little projects. Those are the ones... And there might be enough of those, if you put them together, it makes sense to get them done all at once, spread the cost over a number of years so that the hurt of it isn't as bad to the taxpayers, 
and get get the things instead of keep deferring it. Instead of trying to put it in the budget and keep losing it because it's going to get cut. I think Kim had a comment or question too. Yeah. Do you have another printout of this? I didn't get one. Oh, here. I think there's oh, one. one right there, Is there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Too bad. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Maggie, very much. Okay. Thank you. If you have any other questions, um, Peter, and Betty, too. Okay. All right, great. So um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. And um, right away, um, I want to, we're going to pull. The $1,000 destination imagination um, unanticipated revenue um, because that actually was supposed to go to the Amherst district, not to us, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and I'm also going to pull one of the retirement requests that we're in our packet because that's something that we love to discuss in our public because it's an exception. Um, and which one? Oh, yeah. And the July 21st and August 20th minutes also, um, I'm going to pull right off the bat because we have a legal question on those. So after all those, did you did you pull the October 1st ones nope. as well? I did not pull the October oh. 1st ones as well. Those were not. We didn't have a legal question on those. I don't believe. Okay. They're just some corrections that need to be oh, made. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. I didn't have any corrections. Do you have corrections on October first? I just have one. <coughs> okay, then we'll pull those as well. Okay. And can we just be clear what retirement requests were is still in, that we're voting on? Um, I don't really want to <laughs> What's say. left? Maybe you should Maybe. Pull vote. Okay, I'll pull okay. the vote. All right. You yeah, know, so just so that it's clear what we're voting on. Yeah. So um, we'll I'll, we'll pull them both. Yeah. Um, that does not leave much, so why don't we make the corrections? Yeah, I know. Jeannie, you have the corrections to the October 1st minutes? Uh, yes, um, line 232, um, where it says, um, Mr. Rob Scully spoke about the four different areas of technology they are looking at when they are looking at when building the budget and how they can interrelate. I'm you sure you didn't that? say it that way. <laughs> I think that's what I sound like. You probably did. You're going to say it better when you write it, Rob. <laughs> so just probably take out a couple of those words and it'll work. <laughs> it says, it, just take out that there's an extra... It's four different areas of technology yeah. they are looking at when building the budget and yeah. how they can interrelate. So the just take are out. are looking at. Yes. We could delete. They are looking at. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When they are, they are looking at. When, when they are looking at. Yes. Okay, any other changes? Does anybody all. else have any other changes? No? Okay. Um, so does anyone anyone want to motion to accept, which would just be the treasurer's report um, and the October 1st minutes as amended? And the Sven graphic. And the Sven graphic, and, and the, uh, the graphic um, donation. So moved. Oh. Pim, you're going to second? So sure. Steve moves sure. and Pim seconds. Okay, all in favor? Dave? Oh, okay. Um, any opposed? Okay, so six in favor and Dave is abstaining. He wasn't here. Okay. All right, great. So, presentations. FY17 budget. Um, so, Rob and Betty. Um, I think we're, we're just here going back to uh, uh, when our budget study committee was, was uh, developed in, in 2013 and some of the things that we had uh, looked at and our goal at that time was to develop comprehensive data and budget approach and, and to make sure that we're doing zero-based budgeting as, uh, as we want to. And, and some of the different things that we looked into. Cost per pupil, selling benefits, comparisons, 
Uh, we pulled a lot of data, uh, our enrollment trends, uh, ratios, and uh, as well looked at our learning opportunities program studies and our facilities. So those are the kinds of things that we have been looking at for the last number of years and are still looking at. And a lot of the things um, needed time to kind of put, put things into place to create this budget that we have tonight. Um, let's see. If we look at our goals. I guess, the, I guess the important thing about that is the analysis over those two, two and a half years is what made the recommendations. The budget study committee made about 14 recommendations to the board based on that analysis. Some for future years planning and like negotiations and some for this current budget. Yes. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, so the goals of our, of our current budget, uh, we, we want to uh, have fiscal responsibility. Um, building our student experience, implementation of our SAU 39 strategic plan, protecting our district assets, and to do more with less. Uh, and that's that's really goals that we developed, not just this year, but last year, and those are what we're carrying on with. Let me include this slide to just underline the fundamental principles uh, that we address everything, uh, educationally and building a budget and our mission statement, so he, which we're very proud of, and has guided us, as I said, in decision making, whether it's uh, for educational purposes and now how it uh, impacts our approach to budget. If you just look at the, the bulleting, uh, to support and engage an individual's unique gifts, passions, intentions, to develop and empower the mind, body, heart, to challenge and expand, comfortable limits, to inspire and honor the active stewardship of family, nation, and globe. So again, uh, very powerful verbs, uh, support, engage, develop, that's uh, great for learning. It's a very vibrant, robust teaching and learning environment based on those verbs, but in terms of uh, building the budget, um, those verbs and that mission imply that we're in a perpetual state of growth. Uh, uh, we have to deliver services, maintain and improve practices and systems, but our job is to honor those uh, words that create a very vibrant learning experience and uh, with a very fiscally responsible growth model. So that is, again, what we uh, promote as our fundamental beliefs and in terms of building a budget, there's a lot of uh, implication in there of growth and how we're going to do that responsibly. And so the next slide, you'll hear this term a lot, building the student experience. Um, you'll see on this slide the draft of our goal. Uh, and our goal, again, it's always uh, the... <coughs> You know, serving the two masters of a, a great educational uh, institution, but also one that can uh, do it with a, uh, a budget that's very sustainable. So highlight a few key things here. Um, you'll hear a lot in the coming months and years about an educational system that includes competency-based learning environments using performance assessments to determine student mastery of knowledge and skills. So curriculum will be aligned with standards, content area and course level competencies will be developed, Learning progressions will be clearly articulated. Data and research will inform decisions. Program of studies provides various pathways to experience. Um, the existing philosophies and emerging requirements and expectations that we have to adhere to are in regards to the minimum standards, our strategic plan, and the NEASC accreditation process. So uh, again, this is a slide to provide context with what we're trying to do educationally, and again, uh, really emphasize that the value added, as you know, Maggie just mentioned, there's uh, a, a desire and a, and a determination to be a school recognized at the state and, and national level as a destination high school. So um, we'll be talking budget and a lot of numbers, but we can't forget that side of value added. We're going to be the best high school and uh, the town will really, really uh, be proud of. Um, so this slide just shows a few uh, key statistics so we can just 
show where we've been, which have been pointed out a few times to us, um, but uh, and show where we're going um, and where we are. Our pupil-teacher ratio uh, on the top line, 9.1 in FY13, has steadily increased uh, 10.1, 10.7, and uh, this year it's at 10.9. So that's the direction we've headed in. Cost per pupil, uh, it's another one when you know to us, so we have looked at it and tried to uh, work with that. Our cost per pupil, uh, 19.318 and FY13, has gone down, uh, FY14 it went down somewhat, uh, 19,012, and then in FY15 down to 17,968. Um, and it, I'm just, can I just say like that inverse relationship? I, I was just going to skip. Yeah, that <laughs> Maggie talked about. Yeah, it's not, we, you don't know if you did it or yeah. if it's right no, the numbers. We, well, we, well, no, well, we no. have been we, one of the only schools to have yeah. our cost per people go down as enrollment yeah, has your enrollment gone down. Went up too. Yeah. So well, you, by, that helps yeah. your cost per people. It right. does help. It does so help. It's hard to quantify that. So I was going to skip down to the actually to the October one enrollment and point that out that relationship that Maggie spoke about. And uh, one of the things that we know is that that is the relationship that divisor is going to make the difference. So when we look at next year, we have an 829. So we know um, that that could make a difference and we have to con concern ourselves with the spending. So that's where we've been going. If you'll look at the next uh, line down the, in, the, in the center, the total expenditures. And, and that, so that line, when our uh, enrollment is going down, then we have to make darn sure our total expenditures are going down. So, and that's the direction that, again, we have been heading. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in the right direction. Uh, we have had return of surplus. Uh, some of that has been uh, due to the uh, money that's been returned uh, to us uh, from the health trust, uh, but uh, there have been other uh, other decisions we've made in our hiring and the way that we're uh, administering <coughs> our health care, uh, different things that we've done, decisions we've made that have reduced our costs as well. So we're working on both ends, we like it when we can return surplus from health trust, but we like it also if we can make good decisions uh, that end up allowing us to return money to the taxpayers. Our budgeted staff, the very bottom line, uh, 164.9 in FY13, and is down in this current year. Uh, the budgeted staff is 150. Uh, Betty, can I just ask you to um, clarify the 829 number in FY16 is a projected number. Yes. The other numbers are actual Actuals, numbers. Yes. That's, so you're it, right. It should be the, noted. The FY16 actually, actually is our actual, actual number. Yeah. It's the actual, yeah. It's this year. It's this year. This is 1516. Okay. So I, I, have the, I do have projected enrollment in here, I think, but this is our actual. Okay. All of these we had projected numbers on here are actual this year. Right. At 829. Okay. So Betty, what is the projected for FY17 uh, enrollment? Eight, eight, 13. 13, I believe. 13. Eight, 13. So that's the number that will be used in the zero-based budgeting models? That's the number that we have, yeah. So, um, um, so, uh, FY17 budget changes in personnel. Um, we have uh, this for this coming year that we're budgeting for, there are a lot of changes that we will have that are budget to budget changes. So, so that would be a change from what we had budgeted in FY16 to the budget for, for FY17. Um, we do. We will be down an administrator. We actually have reduced that now, but it was in our budget. So budget to budget, we are taking that out. Uh, the teachers, uh, we're reducing uh, 2.5 teachers. A lot of times, um, uh, a lot of things that when we've done, as I said, we, we've been doing the budget study committee thing since 2013. There are a lot of things 
we had to put into place a lot of things that, that Rob and his staff have done, um, such as getting teachers in here who have dual certifications so that we end up being able to be just a little more agile with our staffing. So we put a lot of different things in place that have allowed this budget to uh, reflect those those things that we now have, sort of like putting uh, the foundation on the, you know, in the house first. And now we've been able to make some big changes because we have that in place now. Um, we have, um, so we've made some other various cuts in, uh, in, in all areas of the budget. So learning specialists, uh, speech therapists, we did have to add a position. Um, nursing staff uh, is, is cut administrative assistant and seasonal facilities technician. So I don't think there's too many areas that haven't been looked at in this budget. And so just wanted to highlight from the building level specifically as we took over a couple of years ago as a new leadership group, it was really, really important for us to um, determine and, and define how we wanted uh, the budget process to go. So some of the words that we use, the themes, uh, fidelity, uh, integrity, transparency, and a zero-based budget process at where we scrutinize every line so I just wanted to take a moment to reinforce you know that we want uh, a dependable honest open process but also we know that we're in a time where uh, for us to be an excellent school there's growth so quite frankly how do we grow with maintaining really uh, moderate to level or even decreasing costs so this highlight a couple areas for example staffing is Betty mentioned in order for us to really have fidelity and integrity to the process, uh, you know, coming in and developing an organizational chart and determining uh, what we have for staffing and reviewing job descriptions and finding redundancies and doing a one, two, and three year plan where we can start uh, addressing those redundancies and folding uh, jobs in and our organizational chart will shrink. Uh, in the next, you know, beginning this year and the next year, and you know, I also want to highlight there's a two and th three year process. Um, hiring practices that involve, as Betty mentioned, you know, dual certification and uh, staffing obviously is critical to our operations, but we really, really want to attack because that's where your big ticket items are and that how can we respond to this growth, offer wonderful curriculum, but also reduce, and I hope during the next couple weeks or next couple months of the process, you'll hear that in more detail. Special education, again, another area where close scrutiny, um, things like closer relationship with you know, AMS as we examine services that we're identifying students for, uh, reimagining some of the programs and how we offer them, uh, and literally down to Meg and her folks counting to the hour what uh, additional services are needed and budgeting specifically for those, uh, and that's that close scrutiny. Technology, a very fluid area. We're really, really going to have to uh, um, keep, a, keep a close watch on that because the, the offerings and what we need for a competency-based education is pretty pronounced. Uh, a specific example of that is where uh, we've been moving more toward a... Um, zero client. So instead of a, a desktop with a tower that might cost a thousand dollars, we're moving to more of a zero client that's three hundred dollars. But the value added is it provides remote access. So any student can access anything that we offer in any device uh, and um, it can be centralized and maintained in one, uh, in one place. So just another example of some of the things that we're trying to do for that fidelity and again detailed uh, as we go through the process. Maintenance, another area where we're looking for efficiencies, uh, whether it's as simple as um, looking at flexible scheduling to diminish or get rid of overtime uh, and uh, a change in practice instead of sending all our guys to five or six different spaces where they clean, uh, we consolidate them, get the annex cleaned, shut it down at five o'clock, turn the heat down, turn the lights off, things like that. So nothing's too small 
for us to examine, uh, and we're really looking that you know no stone unturned and every and every little bit uh, counts. And athletics, same thing, a reorganization, looking at participation trends, making sure that we're budgeting specifically for what the student needs are there. So I just wanted to highlight some of those and hopefully give you just some small example of the of the scrutiny that we're we're taking toward um, the budget. So our proposed uh, FY17 budget, our operating fund, uh, will uh, will be down uh, from last year's budget um, by four percent decrease. So it's uh, a little, uh, about close to seven hundred thousand dollars, and um, our total budget with which includes our food service and special revenue funds will be down 4.03%, just a slight difference. And then again, this next slide, just an attempt to you know marry those two things. We're in the budget process, and of course everything's about budget, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we're trying to grow a fantastic education here. Supporting next generation education, college, career, life ready, the student experience, what's our program of studies going to look like? A short quote from the New Hampshire Department of Ed minimum standards for school approval. The 2014 school approval standards address the change that must take place from a traditional classroom only educational system to a transformed educational system that includes competency based learning environments and multiple pathways to graduation, resulting in students that are truly college and career ready. And frankly, when you look at that and interpret it, uh, we want everybody to know that that does not equal, um, okay, wow, we're going to have to do all these things for students. It must mean more and more and more. Quite the contrary. We think that we can do this with, you know, leveling out decreases in some area, occasionally, uh, you know, an increase in cost, but it's an extremely exciting time to be in education. We're at the forefront of a lot of work. Um, but it's important for folks to know that when we look at this just from an academic standpoint, really exciting discussions take place and, and uh, innovation and, and creative thinking. But we as a leadership group always, always, always have the budget in mind. When we're, for example, curriculum development and assessment. Uh, much of this work has been shifted uh, on site. We redesigned the existing structures uh, um, and are taking advantage of uh, um, our own folks. For example, faculty and department meetings, coordinator meetings. That's over 100 hours of time that we have amongst ourselves that we can dedicate to uh, creating curriculum and assessment. Um, professional development, for example, as well. Uh, we've changed the norm to be more targeted. Not necessarily of what are you interested in, and just you know apply for it and go. It's uh, this is what we need you to do. This is what we need you to explore, and the professional development that we need from you. Teacher leader effectiveness. All the research, teachers, and instruction are the most critical to learning. We've invested there again, um, just at uh, you know creating a, or, or providing new tools allows us to be much more efficient in that work. I mentioned some of the things with technology and co-curricular and the facilities previously, but um, it's important to know, even during the budget season, that this is all really about um, the academic experience, and we're just trying to try to texture our, our, our approach to things. We never forget the budget. There's a lot of demand uh, on um, schools now to be next generation ready, and how are we going to do that? How are we going to have the value added of being a wonderful school in a fiscally responsible uh, approach? And we think we're on to, you know, we're off to a good, uh, a good start. A lot of time, energy commitment, it's very substantial, and the financial commitment could be as well. But um, we feel like we're really, really on to uh, minimizing that, and in some places. Uh, creating decreases that offset, and again, I hope the next couple months uh, illustrate that during uh, the advisory finance committee work. So some of the other considerations we had when putting this together, we will be in the second year of a two-year uh, agreement with the employees, um, and that agreement uh, is has a very low cost to it. That helped us 
keep the uh, keep the budget come in low. Facilities, um, and we do have to make sure that we keep our uh, facilities the necessary maintenance. But not only that, because we do have a desire to be a destination high school, we need to make sure our facilities are top notch. And we have a few items in uh, in our budget, uh, such as the um, the uh, STEM labs. Um, uh, the storage that we need and even a little bit of paving. I didn't know I was going to have somebody working against me here though. <laughs> um, so, we, so we do need to make sure our facilities are kept to be that destination high school that we, that we uh, want to be. The employee benefits, um, projected increases. Again, we were fortunate this year, uh, every two years, the um, New Hampshire retirement gives us a big raise, and I think as Maggie alluded to, a lot of that increase is really not about today, but it's to pay for the past sins because our, our pension is so underfunded. Uh, so I think we have about a 2% uh, give on that, but we have 15% in staff. So, um, so fortunately for us, the uh, New Hampshire retirement was uh, remained level this, this year for, from 16 to 17. That was helpful. We did, however, uh, have a 5% increase in the uh, health care, and we uh, also, we've, we've had this premium holiday that we, um, over the last few years, and we've had that in our budget actually this past year but, uh, uh, for 16, but that won't uh, happen next year. So, so that was a little more difficult uh, to organize around. But, uh, most of the increases uh, we were fortunate didn't uh, raise to that level. Uh, food service again, uh, we do have uh, we do have to worry about the USDA regulations. Pretty much every food service operation in this state is losing money, and to a much higher tune than we are. So uh, we're so grateful to our chef and, and our food service. Our food service director that left us, Danielle Collins, and our new food service director, John Lash. I think they, both of them, have gotten us into such a good situation. We're very fortunate that we're not uh, sort of bleeding the same kind of money as most of the school districts are in, in that area. The transportation was uh, a, a pretty, uh, pretty difficult thing for us last year. We ended up, <coughs> after going out to bid twice, we ended up. Instead of a 30% increase, it was more like a 27% increase, which doesn't feel like good news. Uh, however, it, it will be uh, just over 2% this year in the second year of our five-year uh, five contract. So a little better. So those are some other considerations that we had to look at when building the budget. Uh, but the most of our budget, you know, is staff. And this just gives you a look-see of where we were with our staff and where we are now. So in most areas, we have had reductions. Um, and if you look at the, the uh, regular education, I think it's probably the largest area that we reduced to 74.9 teachers in FY13 down to 64.5 in FY17. And again, just to show you where we ended up with our uh, non-certified staffing comparison. So those uh, we have done some reductions in those areas, not quite as many. Um, so in a year-to-year -year comparison, uh, well, we have we did show you a four percent reduction. Just uh, in the interest of full disclosure. There are a couple things that are in our budget that we're starting with for comparison pur purposes. So we want to bring those out to you and make sure you're aware. So we do have a $220,000 track in there and an expendable trust uh, deposit for $65,000. On the offsetting side of that, we do have the CBA increase that was also voted last year on a warrant article that we have to honor in this budget of 80377 and the health insurance uh, increase of 106 So those two do not offset each other, but it's about a half a percent CBA. difference there, I would say. And the CBA is collective bargaining agreement. Collective bargaining yeah. agreement, yes. 
Uh, it's not. It's not really a collective bargaining agreement here. It's the PPC, so I shouldn't call it a collective bargaining here. But our employee association. So the things that we looked at that were outside of personnel that were critical issues was the redesign of the science engineering classrooms to support STEM labs. And those are proposed in our FY17 budget. Um, the, uh, we also have uh, exterior masonry repair proposed for FY17 and uh, original roads and parking lots that uh, have deteriorated badly. And we have patched and resealed, and this is pretty much it. That's, we're, we're, I think we're done. We can't repair anymore. It'll, it, it won't be useful. It'll be a, <coughs> pretty much a waste of money. So we're at the end of that. So those, those items are in this budget. We're not anticipating any big sinkholes, are we? Uh, I'm not, no. <laughs> Only if I move to Florida. You see that, all those cars that caved into that big single, oh, oh. yes, in the parking lot. Yeah. Nice Where's area. that? Some IHOP somewhere. Oh, oh. <laughs> all right. Not here. Not here, no. Betty? Can we go to the end and just then we'll take um, board member questions and then we'll take other questions too. If you don't mind, Frank, that's okay. Uh, uh, the masonry uh, re repairs, is this what goes back to the Gale report? Yes. Is there something on this slide, Frank? It was, but I, I can wait for it. Now that I went back to it, <laughs> now that I opened the door. So the, the three capital, <laughs> me look like capital issues, how much are they? Uh, so, yeah, the... Uh, the 150,000 for the parking lot. The masonry, I think it's about 20, isn't it? 20,000. I don't have that written down. Yeah, I'm going to have to look them up. I will look. I, I will look them up. How about letting uh, Rob finish? And then I'll, I'll make sure I have the right numbers. So this next slide is just a uh, reminder for some who've been following this closely recently that the uh, budget study committee, as highlighted earlier, has done. Uh, years of work um, trying to be reactive and then more recently the last couple of years very proactive and most recently I believe last spring I think was the recommendation made to the building uh, administration to uh, examine what would a 3% budget decrease look like what would a 4% budget decrease look like what a 5% budget decrease look like taking into account the climate we're in where we're trying to grow as as well as, you know, trying to grow the, from the education realm and, and decrease from the, the budget realm. And uh, quite frankly, um, we, you know, work very, very hard to skip the three altogether uh, and use four as where we feel comfortable recommending our bottom line before it starts to significantly uh, impact programming or that growth. Um, so instead of stopping at three, we went right through that and, uh, you know, four would be where we were comfortable making the initial recommendation. Uh, between four and five, we would look in these areas and just very general, um, that storage need that is overdue um, because we're at the point not only is it, uh, you know, security, uh, it's also maybe even impacting uh, that growth that we mentioned, you know, uh, paving uh, and maybe some of the advice we got tonight is one way we can uh, consider putting that someplace else. And of course, we go to staffing uh, to get to that 5%. So again, a reminder that we were asked to come up with what would 3, 4, and 5 look like. Um, we worked really, really hard and decided not to, um, you know, even present 3 because we feel like we can get to 4. Um, and also, I want to remind folks that there is a, you know, a 2 and 3 year context to look at that this in where uh, additional decreases would happen, but we want to maintain that value added. Yep. And I just want to add to that. Yeah. And I, I just want to add to that two and three year contrast. I think we showed you a history of two and three years back. Rob is talking about two and three years forward, but I think if you look at what we have done over the past couple of years, I think you can see the direction that we're heading. And we have 
we've done the planning, we've put the foundation in place, and we've been able to move to this point. We'd like to feel comfortable <coughs> at this point where, and, and be able to move comfortably to the next point. But we have, we have made those, those changes that put us in a lot better position than we were back in FY13 when we had that $19,000 um, cost per pupil. Yeah, yeah, I do. Well, you said to that next point, and I'm. I, I, could you explain what you mean by that next point? So, I mean, this is today, and then you said there's another point ahead. What is that? I didn't see anything. No, no, to the point, moving forward in redesigning the, the plan as a destination of high school that we are looking at to put in place the efficiencies that we're still looking at with that budget study committee and and uh, that's the direction that we're headed. So what you're saying is the budget study committee has other recommendations that you'll implement at a later time? Is that I, what you're saying? Yes, I, okay, I think we I saw those. Yeah. We, right. I think there were how many of we, them? When we had the public work session with you know, the board, all of us, um, those are the, the recommendations she's talking about, those, yeah. the ones that we brought to you, like the ones that involve negotiations, like I said earlier, um, you know, looking at different structures within the school, those type of things. Yeah, it wasn't I, clear what you meant by next yeah. point. That's what I was well, saying. Well, and I think we have, yeah, and I think we have maybe there were 14 or 15 yeah. recommendations <laughs> there, um, and I think we've Yes. Yeah, so anyway, that's that's the direction that we're moving. Is looking at those all of those recommendations. We've only really been able to move on a few of them. Oh, and and one thing too before before we get to the summary, I want to talk about the paving. Um, so, <laughs> not. I will fight you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. So, so I, I do, and, and it's not that I don't disagree with Maggie on the area of, of amortization. I understand exactly what she's saying, but I do know that a 60 uh, percent, uh, um, a 60 percent bar, as Jeannie said, is very, very difficult for us to get. When we had uh, <laughs> rain coming in on the gym floor, we couldn't get a new roof. Um, you know, so there won't. But it may be that you can have to pay so we didn't, we didn't we didn't have it I believe we took the paving but so so Maggie we proposed the paving with it but I don't believe it ended up in that particular article it didn't yeah. no. <coughs> so it was just the roofing and yeah. the yeah. no, the first one was 2 9 it was defeated 2 million 950 the paving was defeated and you went back well, I'll, I'll check that Maggie yeah. You went back and okay. then your. We, oh, we did go two years, but I don't believe we had yeah, the paving the in, in either one. And the and you but one but the roof. just to just to discuss that paving, so that so that piece of it, the sixty percent, is a very difficult barrier for us to get, and there are costs. There are costs, not just the interest costs to doing the the bonding. But there are also other costs uh, that we have to pay to do the bonding to bonding attorneys and and you know and the uh, you know the costs of doing that financing. So those if we ha had those costs every time we did six hundred thousand dollars of uh, of fixes because that's not a high amount for our budget. If we had those costs each and every time. Those are fifteen to twenty thousand dollars right there, and then we have, and then we also have the, um, uh, you know, the interest rate. Now that at this point in time is is really negligible. I'll, you know, I certainly will give you that. But those two items alone, to to have those for small items of six hundred thousand that we can put over a number of years, not doing it all in one as as we had planned to do a paving program. Um, we have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of paving in this budget, um, so I, I think that that's the kind of thing that we would prefer to look at, so that we wouldn't be looking to a sixty percent bar. Um, and I wanted to, to the storage was seventy five thousand, and I, I lost that page again because I wanted to go back to the paving. Um, seventy five thousand dollars for the storage, one hundred and fifty thousand for the paving. 
And uh, let's see, it's right here. Oops. Uh, Eighty thousand dollars, I believe, for the uh, for the uh, labs, the STEM labs, and the masonry repair, fifteen thousand. And we are, yeah. So, a quick summary: the proposed budget supports implementation of the strategic plan and we try to include on, on this uh, presentation that icon and what specific uh, uh, area of the strategic plan for example streamlining connect is going to be <coughs> critical uh, to our being able to create efficiencies um, at this building and even possibly uh, district-wide um, the budget supports a student experience program of studies that provides various pathways to graduation professional development that improves instruction, curriculum assessment development that uh, addresses the college career readiness and the next generation learning. Uh, it you know, supports uh, cohesiveness uh, throughout the district. Technology integration, fostering greater access to teaching and learning opportunities. Uh, a quick aside there is another you know, example as we blend classrooms to create a more robust um, course as opposed to, you know, the old model. When I say old, I'm even talking, you know, five or six years ago where it was we would just have to layer on another program or, or uh, another course that would um, impact staffing, et cetera. So technology integration that create efficiencies in instruction. Building space configuration to support new learning models. You're sitting in one of them right now. It supports uh, attracting and retaining high qualified employees because we um, pay attention, well, the leadership team at least pays attention to a lot of things, not the least of which is who we're attracting to our town, and we've been encouraged in the last year. Uh, anecdotal evidence suggesting that folks are, are, are searching us out um, as an SAU 39, and it supports you know, the critical facility needs. Um, and we can go on to the Warren articles. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, do you want to questions? stop? Yeah, why don't we have questions oh, yeah. on this, this can, part of the yeah. budget mm -hmm. first, if anybody does. Sure. Chris? I just had a, a couple questions on the um, some of the facility stuff. Maybe if you can describe what, um, what the redesign of the engineering labs or the STEM labs. What, what does that entail? What do we get for that 80000 And um, the same sort of for the storage. What's the proposal for the storage? Um, the STEM labs first. This year, I, think, I forget where we are. Jim might know and John might know where we are uh, as far as accessing uh, um, an agency to come in and do the evaluation. So this year we have um, the redesign assessment. So uh, it's stage one. Mm -hmm. And then based on what that recommendation is next year, we look for the redesign. So we're not sure what it looks like yet because the, the first stage hasn't happened. And that's uh, probably in this spring or in, at some point in the winter. I'm not sure where Jim and John are with getting a group to come in and assess our but current you're, labs. you're confident that 80000 is... Uh, is the right amount, or that's just kind of what you're willing to? No, uh, uh, Jim. Yeah, Jim and John actually. I think they looked at it and felt that that okay. would be approximately the okay. number needed. So the eighty thousand is not an evaluation. It's really to have to implement things yeah, by FY. This 17. year is the evaluation year, and, right. and then we'll yeah. Then we would have them put in. Um, <coughs> so we would be able to. We would hope that we would. We would spend the money this year to, to do that redesign, you know, the, the plan. And then uh, in the summer, uh, the coming summer, we would be able to do that and have it in. So that's, that would be the plan. Jeannie? So I, just, we just, we, I think we need some clarification. Um, the 80000 is buying us what? Stem it, that's the, the actual. The that's the actual work being done. Okay, so it's it, it's getting us a redesign and the work. Yep. So well, well, we we no, we're doing the redesign this year. That's in our current budget. 
but that's that's not just costing eighty thousand dollars for the redesign. No. So so the actual creation, building yes of of those labs yes and furnishing and yes putting the plumbing in everything else will be the eighty thousand. What do you anticipate those changes to be, though? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Well, that's why we're having eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's why. We're do you not know? If you don't know, then it's eighty, maybe plus or minus something. Yeah, so that's why you know the evaluation will be done, and as I said, when John and uh, Jim, uh, you put their heads together so we could uh, put it for next year's budget, they arrived at that uh, figure where. You know, uh, outdated. You know, their original uh, things in that area. Uh, it's not a huge space. Uh, it's not a wing. It's uh, several rooms. But um, it's as simple as updating, uh, as, as Betty mentioned, just the you know the plumbing, etc. But we'll have to look at the design and, and decide um, relative to the. But how did they come up with the eighty thousand? Yeah. You know, can I suggest that, uh, why don't we invite Jim to the next meeting yeah. to go over both the storage and the lab design? Well, I think you'll be meeting with him in the in the subcommittees, and then if that is mm. not, you know, if you don't get a good enough uh, okay. read on it from that point, then then okay. We can. And who's doing? Are you you're doing building and ground? I'm doing. I'm doing. You're doing building yeah. and grounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if anybody has any quite, you know, if why don't you direct your questions to Chris? Yeah. So when Chris meets with Jim. Then um, you know she can clarify yeah. and come back mm -hmm. to us, and, and if, if we still have mm -hmm. questions, then then obviously you know we'll have to have further discussion. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, uh, maybe it was just this last week that I was away and uh, worked thinking about coalition all the time, but. Um, you, when you uh, talked about the framework for how you wanted to, what you wanted to do, Rob, in terms of educational things, um, they were the internal. Those are most of the things you talked about were, you know, internal uh, Salhegan principles. Well, the, in fact, you listed only Salhegan principles. You didn't really talk about the coalition at all. There's no diminished effort <coughs> on maintaining coalition concepts and ideas. Oh, is that there? Is, or is that a given? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, it is. That's, a given. that's where we establish all our fundamental tenets are from the coalition. So it's a synonym. It's so he can slash coalition principles. Okay. Are you talking about the ten common principles, Dave? Yeah, yeah. Basically that. I mean, it wasn't mentioned. It was kind of like, is that omission or is that by design? Yeah, I mean, maybe we should be more more overt about you know mentioning the principles and and how they formulate not only budget but I would say more our academic culture. Well, I think it's become second nature to us almost. So we kind of do things and we highlight those a lot more. Steve, I hate to say the word, but caving. <laughs> the P word? Yeah, the, the P, P word. word. The P word. So the number that, that we've kicked around for the last 10 years or so, mm -hmm. since the airport has been 600,000 total for the, for the, uh, for the total mm -hmm. uh, facility paving, uh, is the 150 an idea to chunk it into quarters, or is, are we just saying, hey, um, petroleum-based materials are so cheap that you can get by with, with a third there of There you go. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, a little bit of both there. We feel we feel we can do a lot more with less this year because of the cost of the petroleum. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we're hoping that we'll get as much done uh, with 150 as what we had planned with 200. Great. And David, just a quick, you know, aside, you know, thinking of your question, this slide mission statement could very easily just also have included the coalition principles, and there actually was an unintentional omission on the next slide, existing philosophies and emerging interests would easily say coalition. Well, that's why I was wondering if you had intentionally omitted those no. for some reason. No. <laughs>
just a little implied and then accidental omission in that area. Ken? Um, it was mentioned that the paving is a capital project. And this mason masonry is only 15000 but does that fall under also a, a capital improvement project? I mean, it is capital it's $15, improvement. $15,000. I don't want to bond it. No, I know, but not by itself. I know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going going off of, yeah. of you know yeah. Maggie's. Um, well, these we are start, very, we you grouping. know what? These are various and sundry things, and somebody who might want to vote for the paving might think the storage no, but they, and then the opposite person might think storage is great, but not paving, and 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 again, as Maggie says, look at the roads. Um, you know, so we mm. might say, oh, well, we would have gotten it if we just put the paving in, but then the, the bond is so much more expensive because, uh, you know, because we have to pay that fee for bonding. And so I, I think it's difficult. These are, you know, um, these are not as large amounts in 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 an $18 million budget, or maybe it's $17 million. Yeah, I mean, it only, only totals 320 so... Yeah. Um, so it's I mean still. it's not that they're it's not that they're small no, no they're not and there's certainly we're bringing them to your attention because they're not tiny but there are things that need to be done and we do want this facility uh, to be maintained properly and we want it to be that destination high school mm -hmm. um, we, we have you know uh, newer shinier high schools next door to us in both directions and we want to make sure that our high school is kept well and uh, and presents well and is that destination high school that people will want to come to it's you know we have the academics we we have a great staff we have great administration great school board but we want to make sure our facility is maintained mm -hmm. and keeps up with the these stem labs are very important for our program well I understand the importance of all this I, I get yeah. that that's not the question I think mm -hmm. the question is how are we funded one right. One way right. Another. And, and yes, and I would recommend that we would have a, a lot of difficulty in bonding these items. If you wanted to put them on a separate warrant article, that's a very different thing than bonding. If you feel you wanted to, uh, because that does not require that uh, fifty percent or sixty percent bar. So mm. that could be an an issue. You might want to say, okay, do we want to do to do it that way? If we do do it that way, does that mean that these um, numbers come out of the proposed budget then? They would come out of the budget and they would go on to a warrant article, mm -hmm. any one of those. If you have a no on those, then uh, because you pulled it out specifically and if the voters vote no, then you may not do it, even if you find money elsewhere, because mm -hmm. no means no. Mm -hmm. And that, I'm not being smart on you, that's, because that's <laughs> the law. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Dave? So, Betty, what would your preference be? I mean, I, I, I voiced the idea that if you have them in a warrant article, mm -hmm. they do not increase the default budget amount for, for subsequent years. Mm -hmm. And that's, to, to, you know, I think that that's a benefit, really, to the taxpayer. But if you put it in the budget, they do increase the, the base amount in reality. And then but, in subsequent but, years, they, they but once it's once that you so once you have you know passed it, then it becomes a part of your operating budget. Right. Once the warrant article passes. Yeah, but you but it doesn't include doesn't account. I thought it did not accrue to the next year's default budget. So. So we would only be doing this one year anyway. I'm not really, yeah, I'm right. not following there's, there's, really. There's no follow-on. There's, there's no follow-on expenditure. It, it expenditure. would be expended, so it's right. yeah. So, yeah. It's gone. And gone. It's if it's done. In, but if it's in budget, it just increases the amount of budget for the next year. And I mean, but, but it, that, would, it would require us to remind you or remind your successor or somebody that you would take that out of the budget because it's not doesn't automatically come out of the calculation for the default. Well, it would if you're doing the default calculation. Sure, right. Yes. It, it so you would. I thought it didn't take come out of the default calculation. No, it did does. Yeah. Any one-time expenditure does. Yeah. Okay. Jeannie? Um, 
you know, it's something for us all to think about. There's a couple different philosophies on on um, budgeting, and you know, the town uses the philosophy that you pull every single item out and have the voters vote on it, uh, which means that you have a three-page ballot, um, and most people don't have a clue what they're voting on, or you um, have faith in the people who are. Um, developing the budget, that they have done their homework, and that they feel so strongly about um, the importance of having these things done that they include it in the budget. So there's there's two different philosophies, mm -hmm. and we just have to figure out which one works for us. Steve? Um, so I, I, I must have dozed off one year because I didn't know we had a seasonal facilities technician or half of one, and now we're going to have less of half of one. Yes. <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> um, it, anybody have the historical perspective a little bit more about when we needed to really uh, work on resurrecting the grounds, etc. cetera. Uh, we added a, we got rid of a 0.5. We, 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 had a, we had it in there, and and what happened was, is we we felt we we <clears throat> actually could uh, we we have had someone who we hire in the summer to help us with the fields and grounds. So, and a few years ago, if you'll notice, if you look at the historical, you'll see that we actually eliminated that position a couple of years ago, but found that we were not in a position to keep our grounds. Uh, we we just didn't have them in the shape. And so we had to go back. And the other piece of it was the, the work that the PPC did this year. And um, if you'll recall, um, we we had our um, facilities people divided into indoor and outdoor. So when we really needed things to be done outdoors, and, and you know the priority in the spring, you might want to bring. Uh, really more than just one person. You might want to bring three, four, five people outside and get something done. Uh, we couldn't do that. So the PPC work that we did in this latest contract, which separate, you know, which allowed those people to, to now be in one employee grouping, and now we can really, we're able to <coughs> more efficiently allocate our staff to where they're needed. So that's a big part of it. We feel that we'll be okay now we did it prematurely. We reduced by that half, and, and it was premature. We had to put it back in. But we feel that now we can not have to have that seasonal purpose <laughs> because of the way that we can allocate our staff. And that's what the seasonal, the facilities technician is just a new title we gave. Uh, well, actually, an example of what I alluded to earlier, as Betty just mentioned uh, to some degree, is uh, a few years ago we looked, we had an inside and an outside uh, supervisor. So we folded that into one position, and through training and new hiring practices, everybody's a facility technician. So we need you outside, we need you inside, we need to deploy differently as opposed to people are hired for inside and people are hired for outside. We're able to, you know, create those deficient, you know, efficiencies by looking at job descriptions, a little training, and so that's an example of. It's sort of like I was saying about, uh, uh, about Rob getting the people in place with the dual certifications. Now we had that in place, we could cut that position now. So it's not just counting on less snow. That too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were hoping for less snow. But the snow <laughs> issue last year, we looked at the overtime. We looked at our winter that we had last year and the overtime for snow removal. So we addressed uh, that working group and, you know, to look at flexible hours. So instead of uh, paying overtime for snow, somebody will come in and their work time will be from, you know. But some of that is to the city, right? To the town? Right, but what we're, you know, for there's responsibilities there's, there's for the town. There's lots that's not. Right. So instead of overtime, come in or somebody will we'll just shift the hours so your day will be, you know, 3.30 a.m. to, you know, whatever. And um, we, you know, we're <coughs> able to look at, you know, just that flexibility and uh, believe it or not, somebody's out there who would much rather work those time periods. So um, just another little slight example of, you know, looking at every area that we can be more efficient in. Because we have a common, because we have AMS over there and we have, you know, the roads over there and the roads over here and the sidewalks between the two. Who takes care of them? 
Um, our, we do our sidewalks and we do we do all the sidewalks and I'm not sure to what degree the parking area we might help but I know the town comes in to do certain areas but for what we're responsible for you know with the winter that we had that was pretty significant so we just upgraded a little bit of uh, equipment and uh, some flexible hours so we'll be able to you know reduce some overtime John and Jim might be able to literally map out where the lines of demarcation are or who's responsible for what but right and we do pay a share of, of the town's uh, uh, bill for that Dave um, uh, the the combination of the four percent that you're proposing this year plus in future years you talked about Betty talked about some additional things that the uh, budget study committee recommended or will recommend it has or will implement I'm sorry will implement mm -hmm. uh, will that march us in you know uh, closer to the ten percent uh, coalition school recommendations and I think I think can we get there I guess is the right question. right and I and I think it should very very much do that but but the big number is that divisor you know what will our enrollment be right so right. it's important you know our academics are important our reputation is important our everything is important in this um, to bring in the students to have the great high school with the great facility and and also to be looking at how we can operate efficiently. But we have a forecast on that divisor. I mean, we've, oh, we, we have I a mean, forecast. Don't, I don't know what it's going to be exactly, of course, and nobody does really. Nope. But um, well, well, there are game, there are of, game changers in that kind of thing, David. Uh, for an example, uh, if we have kindergarten implemented in this town next year, that will make a difference on the type of family that decides to move into the town. So those kinds of things can can change, you know, a, a lot of things. So you know, we don't know what the game changers are, but there are obviously there can be. So and I think one of the game changers is is how well this we we are gaining national acclaim with our work in the PACE program. We you know this is a, a very big deal for Sauhegan. Um So that is attracting people to our high school as well. And that's another game changer. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I, we, yes, we have our, and we have not, uh, we haven't deviated from taking our enrollment and just simply uh, promoting the students. But that's not necessarily the way our enrollment comes about. We have lots of move ins, move outs, and, and we're not sure how that will go, of course. The, and I, I would add that the technology improvements can make a huge difference in that to have that could be a great a big game changer in terms of yes. enrollments and things like that so I acknowledge all that yes it's just that um, uh, I mean the tools are there to get from what I can see the tools are there to get us to the t I don't know if I agree with Maggie's 10 percent by the way but uh, you know that's neither here nor there um, the way she kept it I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that but uh, yeah. so there is some 10 percent number of something that you no, can I, get to. and I'm not agreeing yeah. you know I know what you're saying David I, I think the schools we would look at would be more like yeah. the Oyster River right. school right. That, those schools yes right so, so I, we, but, but, but we Maggie can debate just, that was, yeah and she said she that wasn't she yeah, wasn't up she to her which schools right. we would use so it just seems to me that there's a way to get there yes I, I believe, and it'd just I be nice to know how that would how that would work out and what the other missing elements that they're not in the, uh, the in these costs that relate to the budget study committee and some of the changes are actually very revol not revolutionary but very not very interesting mm -hmm. um, that is, that's not public right so. well no well not I'm really. the negotiation yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, so I won't go into that but anyway, the point the point is that there are some things that can get us there and I just yep. want to make sure that we're Yep. Trying to head in that direction that we have a guideline and what we're trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason we formed that budget study committee. You know, along with just the overall reduction in our cost per pupil and and being able to take a look year round. I mean, it's hard to just fit it into these you know few months and and have a good handle on everything in our budget and how we compare to other districts and where we want to go. 
and it's not just our own comparison to other districts because we don't necessarily aspire to be another district which I know you're not saying but but you know it's good to have a benchmark of where we are right. and that was you know that was a big part of the reason we formed that budget study committee so I think we've got a good handle on it between that and and the recommendations we made that um, Rob came back with as you know like the three four five percent and so um, yeah I think we're definitely getting there and um, Jeannie I, I'm sorry. I, I, yeah. I, I just maybe it's going to happen tonight, but um, I'm I'm just wondering. You know how the budget study committee has met with Rob and Betty, and uh, we've seen what three and four and five percent look like in great detail. Is the rest of the board going to get exposed to that? Um, well, we had talked about doing it in non-public last month because it involved personnel, you know, right. obviously. Um, and I, I don't know if we're going to do it in non-public or not. I don't know if Rob brought because, you know, last month kind of ended where Rob had to leave. So I don't know if that's the plan to do it tonight, honestly, Jeannie, because we um, we didn't talk about the non-public. But um, right, we saw the red, green, yellow, where you know red would be, well, this is going to really impact student learning. Right. Um, the yellow being, okay, this is going to have a short term at the very least impact, but not so detrimental. And the <clears> green <throat> being, yeah, we think that we can make these cuts and not have them impact culture or learning. Um, and I think where Rob came in is somewhere in between the um, green and yellow that I right. just described. I, I understand that. I just I just think it's very informative for the rest of the board members to see that yeah, process and the detail. That. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I just don't know when that's going to happen. And uh, it needs to happen before we meet with our um, individual. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is next week. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I don't know if you're prepared, Rob, well, with the detail. That <coughs> I think when we put this forward, so we did go to 4% on this right. budget so it, and cut a lot of staff in order to do it. So I think a lot of that, instead of the really what the budget study committee saw, I think we when we ended up looking at the budget and, and actually formulating it, we kind of went a little different direction. We thought we can get there to 4%. We don't have to stop at 3 Mm -hmm. And so when we did that, then we looked at all of the staffing that that uh, you know that would get us there, and and we put in certain things in the budget, such as the paving and the storage. Now, if you remove those, you're going to get yourself to the five percent, really. Mm -hmm. So th those items, so you can take those items out to get to the five percent, and I think really that that whole. Uh, we didn't feel we had to rely on that model. I just really, really think the detail mm -hmm. um, in the process that you use to get to that point is essential to share with the rest of the board members. I really, really do. Because, you know, I, I, I understand. Even the public, they can't see the detail, but sometimes the public doesn't understand that um, the budget that you arrive at, you know, in, in its final version has had many, many iterations. Um, you know, it's not as if you just rubber stamped what came before you. There's been a lot of work that has gone in to coming to even this point. Um, and, and I would hate for the rest of the board not to be a part of that. To see the analysis, you mean that would into yeah. it? Yeah. It's also, so, I mean, that was the directive of the board, too. So mm -hmm. for them to be able yeah. to look at what you did, even though you sort of presented that that middle ground. Yeah, sure. I think it's about the, mostly the, the personnel. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would just need, if I'm assuming non mm -hmm. non public, non -public. I would just Absolutely. need the, a minute to run down and get send, it. Well, send it. I go down and send it here. Yeah. Call it up and sure. That would yeah. be great. Well, and you remember that was on the agenda last month, but you know, for personal reasons, rather to have him leave, it was not because he didn't want to share it with the rest of the board. Oh, oh so, I, I, yeah. I know that. I, I just wasn't sure when that was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to to remind us because uh, it wasn't something we talked about as far as having it now public this month. So, so yeah. Okay. Um, so, any other questions for Betty or Rob on this section of the budget? And is there any 
I, only because I heard, you know, in particular, Pim, is there any discussion or does anybody want to bring anything up as, as to how we handle the paving, storage, lab, and masonry costs? Or is everybody comfortable with it being in the budget? Um, you know, and again, Pim, in particular, you brought up, you know, mm -hmm. the warrant article or bonding or the difference, you know, so I guess I didn't know if there was any further discussion anybody wanted to have on that. Well, sure. Um, uh, if, if you pull those items out that you mentioned that would be at the 5% level, mm -hmm. right? Um, to me, that if we do that, that shows a, mm -hmm. a, you know, and we'll hopefully get into this analysis that we just talked about, um, that, that Rob and, and others um, show how to get down to the 4%. But if we get down to 5% and it shows the public that we are being diligent towards uh, reducing our budget uh, and to make it more in line with where we need it to be in, in the direction we want it to go. Um, and then I think to, to Maggie's point, we sell the reasons why we need these other things. Uh, and, and bonding, I don't think, is maybe not the right way to do it, but if we do it via a warrant article, um, and we, we have to sell the public the reasons why we want those items. Um, and made and I don't know, but I'm just kind of thinking out loud, maybe if we show that, you know, we're, we're going, I suppose there's different ways to look at it, right? But if we go to a, a minus 5% on the budget, uh, and ask for another $320,000 over here for a few other items, people might say, well, if you just put them together, you're going to be your 4%. You know, it's, it's, but they might be willing to say, that's okay, because you're showing that you're really working hard to get the budget lower. Um, and so here's a, you know, a bone so you can get these other important things done. Uh, of course, I could, you know, it could go the wrong way too, obviously. Um, so. So so anything that you do pull out and put onto a warrant article, um, you know. So for example, if you do pull out the STEM labs and put them on a on a warrant article, then and and then it's voted down, then we cannot do those because mm -hmm. that right. that would fall under the no means no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and, and and I understand that too, but I think as. You mentioned several times we don't want to make this a destination high school, right? So uh, that is a huge value to the community. Um, and if people, you know, we, we need to sell it, right? So if people don't get that, then we either A, haven't done our job selling it, or B, they don't understand, you know, um, what that means to the community. Um, so. Any other thoughts on that? Do you guys have questions or? I have questions and comments. Okay. I, 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 you know, how about questions? Because I, right now, I think the board kind of needs to discuss. So I think that if you have a question, then then great, Maggie. I have a question on the six hundred thousand. I the assumptions it was we started with six hundred thousand. What will we get for the six hundred thousand? Is that the whole thing repaid? Is that still only a section? What is the no, the six hundred thousand is is all of the paving that needs needs to be redone. It it will cover cover It'll all cover of that. Every. Yeah, and but but I believe. Point, but what? How long do you think? But I actually will last? but I actually believe at this point, um, as Steve pointed out, the petrol petroleum products are so much more reduced. We probably can get that all done now for four hundred and fifty. So that's why we put the one fifty and seven. Okay. But but what I'm saying is that's another reason you just gave another reason why to do it all at once. Because if petroleum costs are down, we should pave like crazy now while it's cheaper. Okay. You Let's stick to the questions though. Can no, but I just want to know if the scope was and what will be the useful life of that? I well, think well what we have is 25 years. It's not as useful as it used to be, but it's 25 years old now. So anything new would last? It would be 20. Years. It would be 20 years. But, but 10 years ago, we said we needed to replace it. So it's more than 15. School's 22 years old, and we've been needing to replace it for a while, yeah. so 20 I think, might be stretching. I think it was 25. 
It was opened in 92. Yeah, 92. So we were looking at, at FY17. So that's 25 years of that pavement fee. Yeah. Um, Frank, you had a question? Yeah, Ed, can you put on the key statistics slide? Maybe? Yes. So um, yeah. just in, in FY19, we spent 17,363. Just so I'm yeah. sure I understand the question. Oops, my key stuck. Sorry. <coughs> Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay, so it's the yeah. second from the left. Mm -hmm. Second from the right. Okay. Yep. So that's what we spent this mm -hmm. current year. And the cost per pupil is is based on that number. So the well, loosely based ba loosely based on that number. Okay. It's not that number, no. Just so just to point out. So it's seventeen three sixty three eight hundred and forty two students and that's so this coming year we're proposing a budget that's um, something like 18. So, so the budget to actual is about a million dollars more. Um, no, no, no. The total budget, I'm just it says total expenditures, and I'm comparing that to the total budget. That's why I want to say two slides later. Oh no, it is. I, I apologize. It's 17. Right. So yep. the, the budget proposal is three hundred thousand dollars more than we actually spent this year, and with a decreased population, you're going to drive your cost per pupil up again. So just understand that. I I follow. Yeah. Is that seventeen three sixty three including war order? That's that's everything, that's everything. That's everything we spend. Okay. That's and so includes capital items, everything, not included in your cost per pupil. So you're going to see and and so the money for the paving, for the for the storage, for the um, STEM labs, all of those items would not be included in the cost per pupil. Mike, do you have so, a question? Just, oh. I mean, I have to, so. Somebody, I mean, I, I hear the capital issue. So my view on the capital is, you ought to be asking for two hundred thousand dollars every single year to maintain this building. I, I believe that's your core responsibility to have an operating fund for maintenance to do the stem labs. And every year you ask for it, and it's in there. And then you don't have to come and ask, and you tell people what you're doing it for. But to think that you can operate a business like this and not have to continue to refurbish it every single year, something's going to come up. And every once in a while, something bigger is going to come up. And you ought to be asking that. And you are not going to nick and diming us for, you know, approve this warrant article for this or that. But if it's a big one, yeah, you ought to. Because, you know, if I'm going to be here another three, four, five years, why should I pay for something that's going to be 15 or 20 years out if you're going to build a new addition? That ought to be amortized. But this, you know, these operational expenses absolutely have a budget, you know, in the same as doing the middle school. Yeah, and if you keep the budget flat, then we're not yeah. going to see the difference in our tax. No, set aside a reserve fund. It's, you know, that, this is it. You know, and, and list all the things that would be charged of that because, you know, it's silly. They should, they should get done, absolutely should get done. Um, and that's part of what I think I expect you to go do, and I expect we have to spend money for that. Mike, do you have a question? Yeah. I, I have two quick ones. Um, all of the town organizations send representatives to a capital improvements planning uh, effort every year. And, the, and there are guidelines that everyone agrees to. Um, you know, a one-time kind of thing under, under a certain number, put it in your operating budget. Something that has maybe two or three year shelf life over fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars, you have to use free capital reserves and fund it that way. And then you go all the way, go all the way up into the bonding. And the reason Salgigan and ASD and the town gets together is because if you don't coordinate those kinds of stents, right, you whack the taxpayer with a good amount of money in it, in sort of an unplanned way. So the whole idea is to get people together, talk these things through. Figure out, like bonding six hundred thousand dollars. What year would you do that and go forward? And it's a it's a discussion and a negotiation so that you even out the tax rate for you know citizens. So you guys participate in that, right? ASD 
case, down with this case. But it sounds like you're just sitting here now arbitrarily deciding, let's do it this way. So my question is, what did you talk about when you participated in CIP about these things? Well, there, yes, actually, I think Steve has something here. Those, that, the, yeah, it's on the, yeah, it's in there. It's on the CIP. And the storage is there. And it's on there as a, essentially a warrant. It's a cap, it's a, it's an operating expense item. It's a warrant item. Oh, oh. So if it was in the plan, now you're doing something different. Well, no, no, we're consistent except dropping it by 50,000. Maggie's saying do something different. Yeah, it was, we, we had that in there at $200,000. We also have thresholds, what he was talking about, capitalization that you guys are not following. Okay, you know what, I think the board needs to deliberate and discuss right now. I mean, you guys have had a lot of input and we really need to discuss the budget ourselves. We understand there are different ways of approaching it and that's why I was asking, you know, Pim in particular or anyone else in the board whether they had thoughts on that. So I think we're going to come back to our discussion and then let Betty finish her presentation on the budget. So I don't know if you, if anyone actually wants, has a comment about Pim's thoughts and ideas. Normally, at least my recollection is we have often, you know, sort of waited to determine whether we were going to pull things out closer to the time when, when we really have to make a decision. And so I'm just wondering if, if, is there an urgency to make a decision tonight on whether we pull it out or not? With our individual sections of the budget yet. And so I think until we get, and a good example is, you know, asking Chris to go back to Jim with the questions that came up earlier. And I think we need those, you know, for me, I would need to, you know, to know about what the lab reconfiguration entails before even making a decision about having it in the budget, having it in a warrant article or either, you know, for that matter, depending on what it entails. So I agree. Because we have to believe in it too. Yep. I agree. So I think it's a little early even. We don't even know if we, for instance, believe in the lab reconfiguration or what it entails. So let's wait before we decide if it's on a warrant article or in the operating budget. Okay. Howard? Betty, how much is in the maintenance fund? How much? The maintenance. So, oh, the expendable trust. Yeah. Yeah. We have that in our budget assumptions. There was a last one. I can look it up. It's right here. It's $109,000. Okay. Any other questions about this part of the budget for Betty or Rob before we move on? Steve? No? Okay. All right, Betty, do you want to go ahead with them? Yeah. So this is our warrant for Sylvia. I hope everybody will look at this very carefully and check my cut and paste efforts. Make sure I've changed every day and all of that kind of thing. So just however, so Monday, February 1st will be our deliberative and March 8th is voting day and all of that should be in there consistently. So the Article 1 is our election of officers. We have two members of the board for three years, one member for one year, and one member, that's from Amherst, and then one member for three years from Mount Vernon. Does that feel right? One Pim or Howard? Must be Howard. Howard. Okay, so just check my work there and make sure you're all in agreement with that. And then our first article is simply our operating budget, or Article 2, I should say, is our operating budget, which just looks the same every time. I just left these things blank or 
highlighted the items that we'll be changing as we move along in the budget process, um, like the money part. Um, the uh, and then the Article Three uh, Shell Sauhegan uh, Cooperative School District established a non-lapsing athletics revolving fund in accordance with RSA 193. 194.3c to be funded by rental and user fees from the rental of school district facilities further to raise up to $50,000 for the purpose of supporting athletic facilities. And this is a little bit confusing because the, um, the town is permitted to uh, create their revolving fund and then not have to put a dollar amount that they are going to declare that they're putting into it. Now all of this dollar amount will be, uh, there'll be no tax impact. It will all be money that will be raised from rentals. Uh, so no taxpayer money uh, for that. However, uh, in school districts, um, per the attorney, we have to put an amount uh, that we uh, that we would be putting up to that amount in. So I just put a, a good high amount of $50,000. We can all go out there and hustle and rent our fields out and get that up to $50,000. So that's the piece um, where we have, and later on tonight, we, we do have the lease agreement uh, addendum that we have that will allow us to put, uh, to receive money from the town that we will be putting into that revolving fund. Eddie, um, yeah. Does that does that stay static for the forever? That fifty thousand dollar number? No, it, it's this. It's one year. So we would. I, I, the way okay. I understand right. so each year we would have okay. to declare how much money we will be putting into that and okay. how much money we will be spending out. In this particular instance, the $50,000 we're raising, but we're not expending any because we don't expect to expend right. any. Right. We could put that we would expend some and then not expend it. And that might be a thing that we want to do. And I'll, I'll talk further with the attorney about it. But we might want to do that in case there was some reason we put money in and for some field maintenance issue, we did, would want to take it out. It would be an option that would be there. Okay. I, what I'm afraid of is if you put a static number in there, and then after 20, 30 years or something, they're re replacing the, you know, the, yeah. the stuff that it, it becomes way too little. Yeah. It's, so it's not a static number. No. Okay. No. Okay. So yeah. So one of my questions was, we'd see this every year. Yes. Right? And then my second question is, is it possible to change the wording? such that it's to be funded solely by the rental. And so in other words, when, when taxpayers are reading this, they're like, okay, you know, and I mean, I know you're going to have yep. the no tax impact, but when they read this, that it's and, not and, on And I think it probably would be fine to put that in. Mm -hmm. The fact that we say that it will be funded by rental and user fees from the rental school district facilities actually means that we can only put rental and user fees in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, I think just to be yes, I, I understand what you're it saying. It would be it would give more confidence to the taxpayers. That is all that's going in there. No mm -hmm. tax, uh, mm -hmm. no tax payer money. And that's for all facilities, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Including the school and uh, auditorium. The uh, the supporting athletic oh, facilities. Athletic facilities. Uh, auditorium's not athletic. Facilities. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, okay, I didn't read that. Well, it's an athletic facility, so. Whatever right. you determine is an athletic facility, okay. that would be what you you would be supporting with this. Jeannie? Where does it say there's no tax impact? I was going to ask. Well, it doesn't, well, it doesn't yet. yet. None of that is determined yet, but I, I'm pretty sure when I put the estimated tax impact uh, is an increase, well, I have the increase, I'm pretty sure we'll just instead say no tax impact. Yeah. But these articles were just written. With okay. I just don't want us to forget because the average person is going to see this and go, oh my God, we're going to raise $50,000 and yeah. I'm going to say no because I don't, no. you know. We'll put no tax impact Thank on Thank you. <laughs> For sure. We won't argue over this one. <laughs> we'll yellow out those two lines then, Betty. What? Yeah. I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah, those are just, you know, uh, um, I, it's a template and I just yellow the things that I need to change. So, I because when you use cut and paste, it can be your friend, but it can be your enemy too. Yeah. Um, and then Article 4, so the Sauhegan Cooperative School District has to raise and appropriate up to $65,000 from year-end undesignated fund balance. And uh, this is pretty much about the paving. Yeah. So <laughs> Should so, we increase this? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Frank says yes. So... <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, I, I don't know the uh, the amount of money that you would want to put in there, but that I did want yes to put money in there because our, as I said, we need to get this stuff paved. There's no question about it. We can't right. band aid it any longer. It's done. I think this is the first look like we talked about. If we want to increase it next time after we've met with the individual committees, we'll talk about increasing it. Mm -hmm. And who's on this, this committee? Uh, the Buildings members? and grounds, Chris. Mm -hmm. So. One of my questions would be, can we do it in stages? And so Jim, you do okay. the, the front half and then the, the back the paving. half. Well, and, and that's what we're proposing because it 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 would be three stages the way we're proposing it. 150,000 this year, 150 next, and 100. But but in the meantime, trying to put money into the into the um, fund, the expendable trust fund, so that maybe it's not always you know as much on the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, can we go, Steve, and we um, could, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we could take a page from last year, too, because mm -hmm. we could do a piece of it as we did with the track. And uh, Steve, what, um, just so we all know, what uh, part of the budget are you on? That's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I didn't know there'd be a quiz. Technology. technology. It's technology. And <laughs> so on the grounds, I'm on administration. Food and transportation. Transportation. Sped. And curriculum. curriculum. And athletics. And athletics. Okay. So if any of the questions, you know, and again, we can email each other and ask who who's on athletics again, but so that we can direct questions. But obviously there's going to be a few for Chris. So, okay. Any more, Betty? And that's all the warrant articles that we're looking at right now. That's it. Okay. All right, any more questions on the Warren articles? And again, we'll be reviewing them again next month and can make changes still. All set? Okay. All right, so at this time, I would like to ask Dwayne Purvis and Ken D'Ambrosio, who are the co-chairs of the Sahedian Advisory Finance Committee, to introduce their <coughs> committee members. And maybe you guys could say also, if you've decided, which part of the budget you are going to be on. Uh, first of all, we have uh, the members from Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon is being popular. Oh, okay. I should have come up. Yeah, I The members from Mount Vernon are Ian Conkren and Jane Keane. Could you raise your hand, Jane? Hey. <laughs> Hello. And for uh, Amherst is uh, Sue Burchard. I believe she was here. Lisa Eastland, uh, Beth Kuzma, Hi, Beth. Ken D'Ambrosio, co-chair, and myself, co-chair. Okay. Uh, comments at this time regarding the budget? I don't have any comments at this time, and I don't know if anyone else has. Have you guys decided which sections of the we, budget we, you'll be We, we have. I don't have that. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, no, hang, on a second. hang on a second. <laughs> yes, that, that, that has been done. Uh, do you have it, Betty? Uh, I, yeah. That's okay. I just thought it might. Yeah. We we know you know we know that we're on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do have that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Transportation. Oh, you have it. Yeah. Well, because I couldn't carry the whole. Uh, uh, do you want to uh, read that off, Betty? You have the microphone. Do you want? I'll let Mary Lou read it. She can. I was really just—I just thought we could put a face with a name if we, you know, yes, so we knew yeah, who was. Right. Yeah. But okay, so from the committee, Dan Corcoran is going to be on administration. Beth Kuzma um, is special education. Uh, Jane King is facilities. Sue Burchard is school nutrition and transportation. Dwayne is on curriculum. Ken is on technology, and Lisa Eastland is on athletics. Okay, right. great. Thank and. Thank you guys, first of all, for volunteering. I, it's a, it, we know it's a lot of time, and um, so we really appreciate you guys volunteering for this and putting the time in. All right, now I said I didn't have any comments, did any of the... Okay, great. great. Thank you. We'll see you next month. Okay. Um, and also in the future, we're going to, you know, because, and for those of you who don't know, we break up the budget into sections like we just said, and we meet with administrator and, and other pertinent people within the building or SAU 
um, to discuss each part of the budget. And so we are going to ask this year for comments from the administration as well as comments from the Sahegan Advisory Finance Committee at each meeting. Okay. Um, informational. You guys got the law regarding student representatives at board meetings. And the reason we put that in there is because our previous student representative um, wanted to be a full-fledged board member and sit at the table. And, and there is a law saying that they can do that and have all the rights of board members except voting rights. Um, I'm not sure that most students have the time to do that or the desire. Um, they're long meetings sometimes, and they would not be a part of non-public either. So, um, but if the situation or if the thought does come up again, it's something that we would need to vote on. That's why that was included in there. So. Could I just ask a question about that? If, sure. if it does come up again, it does state that it, I believe they have to be elected by the student body, mm. and currently mm -hmm. it's community council. Does that... Does that suffice? We thought that it did. If if other board members think that it needs to be the whole student body, we can discuss that because I think this is our policy. Um, we thought that because that they're elected to community council and then elected to that position, um, okay. but if it comes up and other board members have other ideas, you know, or don't agree with that, then we can certainly discuss it at the time. No, I was just curious as to whether that wor that would work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, action items, the recreation lease addendum that Betty mentioned earlier, and we've all had a chance to look at that, so hopefully everybody's read it and, and has, if you have any questions or comments, you know, so, we'll take them now. Yeah, so oh. what, what this lease does is, is simply that the, the parties acknowledge that the town maintains the Amherst School District facilities and that Southeastern Cooperative School District maintains its own facilities. So, and in recognition, uh, in recognition of this, uh, commencing on July 1, 2016, the town shall reimburse the South Higgin, uh, School District for field maintenance in an amount equal to 85% of the monies the town collects from user fees and revenues from rental of all South Higgin facilities. And then the, um, the rental fee will be paid to the town on a, on a seasonal base, basis. And it also... Uh, uh, stipulates that we'll collaborate to establish uh, hourly rates for the rental of the stadium <coughs> and the town shall be responsible for setting user fees and rental rates. So everyone had a chance to read that, right, and is familiar with it. Any questions or co further comments? No? And it has... What's that? Uh, I was just saying it, it's already gone to the Amherst board yeah. as well as the town, so both of those bodies, which are the three bodies, are, are party to the lease. Mm -hmm. So we would need to vote on that tonight as long as everybody agreed with it. I move that we approve. Okay, a second. Okay, Steve, uh, Howard seconds. Any further discussion on that? Steve, are you pondering something? No. no? I'm waiting for you to say all in favor. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. All right. No, if no further discussion, all in favor? All right, unanimous. Great. That that uh, again. I'll reiterate that we're very thankful to the three bodies working together to make this happen. And and I didn't say this last time, but it would not have happened without Betty's hard work making this happen. So thank you very much, Betty. Oh, well, well, no, really, this is my job. Very important. Um, all right. In policies is the next action item. We've. Um, only got really actually one policy that we're going to be uh, <coughs> tonight because the ethics policy is going to be brought to the SAU. So we had it. Yeah, yeah, on Tuesday. So we had a chance to read it, and it was sent to us via email. So if you have any questions, you know, you have a chance I just to. Want a clarification? Oh, yeah. what staff ethics or the board ethics? Board oh, ethics. Board ethics. Okay, because the staff ethics that was in by the state. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, I thought we were relooking at that. Okay. Yeah, no, the board ethics, well, but it's going to be adopted and revised okay. by all yep. three. Yep. So yeah. Um, but there's, oh, sorry, Jean. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, we did work on it in the policy committee, and I just wanted to, um, we're really not going to talk about it tonight, but if you could just read it with these things in mind when it, it goes before the SAU board. Yeah. Um, the um, number 14 is um, actually, I don't know if you guys have it in front of you. Um, it was sent by, um, by Mary Ann. 
A couple. There we go. Is this the newer, the newest one? Let's take it out. Is it? It has 14 items in it. It has 14 items. Scroll down to see. Yep. 14 is, um, just needs to be altered, the tail end of it, um, to reflect, um, um, it should read, work with the board, with other board members to establish effective board policies and to delegate authority to the administration of the schools to the superintendent, to the superintendent of schools. Right. So that one was just, it was, it, it was one of the ones that member um, Peter that I yes. had altered yep. and we needed to go back to the old yep. version. So that one needs to be changed. The other thing that um, I just wanted to point out is that we, um, the original had a statement in it um, in number three um, that said, make decisions only after full discussion at public board meetings, render all decisions based on the available facts and my independent judgment. We took out and refused to surrender that judgment to individuals or special interest groups. So I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware that um, we decided that that, that sentence stood alone without that piece of it um, and accomplished the same thing. Um, the other thing is uh, just to consider whether um, we want to formally um, review it annually somehow, review the, um, the ethics policy. Um, so that will just be part of the discussion at the SAU board mm -hmm. meeting. Did you guys talk about new board members reviewing it at the very least, or? Yeah. We did. We actually talked about it um, being presented to all of the boards at the April meeting. So that would be new board members at the beginning of a new year after the election. And we would do that every year so that everyone would have that opportunity to read through and have some questions. That's on a yearly basis. Right. Great. Thank you. I apologize for 14. Uh, That's okay. So what I did was... The 14 yes. that we took from the other page. Yes. Asked Marianne to type that in, so that's what happened. It's so okay. We'll get that right. So <laughs> for Tuesday, right? right? And then policy DGA, not a huge change, not a huge policy, but it was in our packet. So are there any questions on that before we take a motion? That was on the authorized signatures. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to talk to that yeah. one? Oh, okay. yeah, I can explain what it is. Uh, oh, sure. For it if you want to know. Sure. Oh, I already know, but I guess, yeah, maybe yeah. only the policy yeah. committee does. Yeah. So, so the pre-numbered tax, uh, which uh, we used to <laughs> always have, and, and and if we had them pre-printed, they should be pre-numbered. But now that we are no longer pre-printing, uh, pre we have our own microprinters, if you'll recall, we mm -hmm. those at the last SAU. Uh, uh, budget last year and so we have our own printers and now as our check stock is running out then we would like to uh, start purchasing the, uh, uh, those uh, checks that we had planned to which will be yeah. a good money savings and, and it's a different kind of security issue when you have checks that are already printed then you do need the pre-numbering but since you're not going to don't want that now and that and so can't have it there's there, nothing on the check stock. Are there two DGA policies, or what is it? Why am so, I seeing two? So, uh, I, I, you know what I did? I, so I just asked uh, Marianne, I said, here's, here's what I want you to do. Right there. And oh, okay. Yeah. Just took off the line. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Before and after. Yeah. 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 Before and after. Exactly. Okay. Just, Overachiever. Uh, okay. Take off the pre numbered and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Steve? So I, I, I happened to discuss this policy with the treasurer today, <laughs> and, and she was surprised by it and wanted to talk to somebody else about it. So I would ask that we call this a first reading and not vote on it tonight. Okay. Um, did you refer her to Betty? Uh, I did. I believe she has something in my email, but I, I didn't know because <laughs> I didn't return your calls. So I was pretty much in the meeting. Yeah, yeah, you're in, yeah. Busy all day. Okay. I, I agree with that, Steve. But any questions? We will have a second meeting next month. But any questions until then? No? Okay. All right, we'll call this the first reading, and I'll put it on the agenda for next month.
Um, okay. We're going to um, actually hold off on the field trip um, because we're going to wait for um, more information on that. We just uh, realized that we needed, so we're going to wait and ask if we can do that in December also, if that's okay. Yeah, we apologize. Yeah. I'll share that information with you just before you go. So, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So... For December meeting uh, meeting agenda items so far, I have um, the Spain field trip. I have the policy DGA. I have um, the leave totals that Rob is going to provide us another link to. I have the community council decision on credits for academic support. Um, and, of course, the budget discussions and information. So I'll send that out via email again, but if you guys have any other ideas right now. I, make I sure found it handy when you did that, when you send it out. Okay, good. good. Yeah. yeah. The ethics policy should be on there yeah. as well. Yeah, after we go to the SAU. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which one? All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else These people can think of? And again, I'll send the email out, but I just didn't know. Yeah. Did you have something, Dave? Yeah. Did you want to put the Courtney Banger thing in? Uh, yeah. I, I actually yeah. already had that written down. Yeah. All right. Okay. Fine. Um, and actually, I was thinking of maybe even mentioning it tonight when Rob read the letter from the alumni because Dave received another um, real positive uh, letter from an alumni, Courtney Banghart, which everybody, I'm sure, not a lot of people probably have heard of. And um, Dave knows personally, but she was glad to hear that Dave was on the City Eagan board, and she said, um, I'm glad to hear you're giving back. I think were her words is in particular, <laughs> in, in, to, in particular to Sohegan because it did so much for me and my classmates. And she's Courtney's the one that that uh, coached at Dartmouth is now at Princeton has won uh, uh, three titles at Princeton, five. five titles at Princeton for for basketball. She's the head five basketball Ivy coach. League titles. Five Ivy League titles. So Isn't she also but just she, voted in as one of the top yeah, that's 50 the whole thing, right? Most powerful. I'll send you a link. In Fortune, Fortune yeah. Magazine. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. and here she is thanking Sahegan High School. So that, that's pretty cool. And Dave. But I asked her to come and speak yeah. to us. Mm -hmm. We talked about it. And the, the student body. So at some point we need to discuss, we should yeah. discuss that and see how yeah. we want to make that happen. Steve? So um, just to circle back to the field trip, uh -huh. um, Dave had an idea that he sort of whizzed by me quickly at, uh, last week. And I, I don't know if you want to. Suggest that. Which idea was that? <laughs> it's about parents oh, and participating. Yeah, yeah. So, do you want to? So, uh, just the thought was that uh, when we do our review, uh -huh. that we invite the parents of the kids, the prospective uh, students that would be going, they can come and join us and ask questions, and you know, so they get an idea of what the process is for approving it, and they participate in that process as well, in which in a way, is a way of thinking about sharing the, the responsibility for this. Yeah. Um, I did forward your comments and ideas to Pete. And yeah. So um, maybe next week when, or next month when we um, approve or when we talk about approving field trips, including the Spain one, um, we can have that discussion at that time. We were going to hold that up to February. You and I talked about Oh, that. well, Steve brought it up. I don't know. All right, all right. Well, <laughs> yeah, we well, right. Whenever well, it is, if, if we're going to talk about the Spain trip and... and well, I don't know if we have... Well, yeah. Uh, we, that's something that Dave and I talked about, too, but I didn't expect to be brought up tonight. We, we did talk about putting... He was saying there was really no rush, and since we're in budget season now and we have a lot of other things going on that we talk about in February, but... You know, but I like the idea of doing it for at least as a temporary thing. Maybe Peter can. Yeah, I want to get input from Peter as well. And sometimes we don't even have the students right. that we know are going on the trip. Well, that's well, what I was thinking. So we wouldn't have any right. parents until associated we, until with board them. Yeah. yeah. At least that's the way it's Which is a great order. order. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great order. Yes. <laughs> great order. <laughs> yeah. All right. But, but we'll still keep it in mind for February just because yeah. it, it could you know, we could look at the policy and maybe incorporate something in the policy even or on the field trip form that, that uh, Pete gets from the staff members. All right, so that brings our regular meeting to a close. We do have some non-public issues that the board has to discuss. Um, so... A motion to go to non-public? 
Okay. Second. So you want to state that you're going into non-public session under 91A, column 3. Which letter? A, B, and C for personnel and reputation. Bye. Thank you guys for coming.